All righty. Everyone, so I was, I was literally just asking Gabe, you know, what's his full name? And uh, you, you proceeded to tell me what, like, six names. Gabriel, <laughs> Antonio. Teixeira, Dos Santos. Dos Santos. I feel like that's the one that people have, like, the most problems is, like, Teixeira. Teixeira, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's actually pretty good. Like, Teixeira, Teixeira, okay. So what, what, how come Brazilian names, like, well, do all Brazilians have that many names? Yeah, most of them. Like, usually, like, three to four. Usually three to four. Like minimum, I would say it's probably like three names. You wow. usually have like two. I think you call like common names, like uh, like first name, like Gabriel. Yep. Usually would be like Gabriel something. Another like a common name, like Gabriel Antonio. In my case, my brother is like Bruno Joao, like okay. Joao Miao. Yeah, yeah. And then the surname would be the next one, but because some people have like two surnames, like my dad, he has like Teixeira and Santos. Yeah. Mine is like Gabriel Antonio Teixeira dos Santos. Oh wow. And if they want, they you could also like add my mom's name, and then I would have like fucking, you know, extra, a whole a again. whole phrase. So, so is that, is that the, the? I don't understand why they would do that because then when you go like generations, right? Like names yeah, would end is. up like a hundred names long, right? Yeah. And some people like like a very common name in Brazil is like Silva. Yep. And like sometimes like your mom and your dad, they both have Silva in the name, <laughs> and then they're gonna go like Gabriel Silva Silva. They would For do some that. reason. They would yeah. do that. Yeah, like there's a lot of names like that. Wow. And then we also have some weird names sometimes. There's like <laughs> people like American names and they don't know how to spell it. Yep. And then they just like pretend they know what they're doing and they just put a random name in uh, the birth certificate. Wow. And it looks horrible. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> looks horrible. All right. So, uh, you know, which part of Brazil did you grow up in? I'm from south of Brazil. So like um, I would say I'm probably like three hours fly from Argentina. So it's... It's very south. Very south. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I could go further, but like, it, I'm pretty much like in the board. I'm the like Argentina. Yep. Okay. And um, I guess, you know, for you, what, like, what are some of the memories of, of growing up in that part of Brazil? What's the name of the place? Sorry. Um, I'm from a small town in Brazil. A small town for Brazil is like quite big in Australia. It's like 65,000 people. Okay. But uh, it's called Campo Bom, which means like good field or something like that. Like Good field. Yeah, like okay. yeah, because like lots of fields over there. Like it's not a, there's not much to do there. Okay, like, it's very boring. A lot of like old people as well. Yep, but I do know a lot of people that came from there to Australia. Yep. Like I have at least five people from my hometown. Yep, oh, I'm just gonna move back so yeah, get a bit more comfortable. Yeah, gets easier. Um, yeah, okay. So so how many people in your hometown? Five thousand. Sixty-five thousand. Sixty-five thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which life for Brazil is small. It's small. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then, um, so what was, like, when you were growing up, like, what sort of things would you do as a kid? I did a little bit of everything, like, because, I mean, soccer in Brazil is huge. Yep. So I did a lot of soccer from, like, 6 to 14. I played, I like, proper training and, like, proper, like, school, um, like, soccer teams and stuff. So I did pretty much, that was my, like, whole, like, juvenile and, like, um, everything was based around, like, soccer. But my dad didn't really like it. Okay. And then I think because he didn't like, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it. Okay. <laughs> so it was like, I, I did play. So I would go like, because in Brazil, we go to school, like you choose one of the uh, the times to go. So are you going in the morning to like midday yep. or you go in the afternoon? Mm. So then you go like uh, 1230 to five. Okay. So it's not like in Australia, like that you go eight to like 3 p.m. or something like that. So I had like all afternoon for myself. So they would put me like in a soccer team to play and I would like train every day for three hours. And then on the weekends, we would have games. Wow. And then I did that from like 6 to 14, roughly. So, so very different in that sense, like from schooling perspective. So you'd, you'd play, you'd train soccer almost every day. Yeah, like uh, like not full time, but like more than I train jiu-jitsu now. Yeah. Which is quite and, a bit. And was that like done via the school or was that done? No, separately. Because like in Brazil, we have like lots of teams. Mm. And like south of Brazil, we have like pretty much two big main ones. And I got into, not juniors, but like uh, year six, seven. 10, 12, and 14 in, like, one of the big teams, like, the proper league, like, the adults league. Yep. And then if you keep going, you eventually might get, like, a spot on the team and, like, make money out of it. But I wasn't good enough for that. I was, like, just enough to play in the teams, play in a few, like, games and blah, 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 but not enough to become a soccer player. Yeah. Yeah. And then you mentioned, like, you know, because your dad didn't like it, that's why you wanted to do it. So yeah, yeah. Th there's got to be more to that story, right? So Yeah, it's because my, my dad is, like, um, I always forget how to pronounce that in English, but it's, like, karate, you know, like, karate. Karate? Yeah. 
Is so my, like my dad is a black belt in karate. Oh, okay, okay. So like he always tried to push me to do it. Okay. And I was like, nah. You didn't want to do it? That's that's dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and <Shit. then> <laughs> fighting words. <laughs> fighting words already. <laughs> which which style of karate? Uh Otokan? Otokan? Dojokan? Shotokan? Shotokan. Okay, that's Shotokan. it, that's it. Okay. Like he's like a fourth degree black belt now. Okay. And like at the time I think he was like So he's serious about his karate. Yeah. Yeah, now he is again. Like he stopped for a bit. He I think he got his he was a brown belt and then he was going to the Nationals teams in Brazil. Yeah. Like and then I happened. Yeah. And then he kinda stopped for a bit and then started again once I was born and then stopped for a bit. And now he's like he's a he's an instructor in Brazil as well. Yep. So like he always tried to push me to do it. I did a little bit of everything. I did like capoeira, I did Muay Thai, I did boxing for a while. Yep. But like only like a few months here and there. And then I never really wanted to do karate because yeah. like it's not for me. So, so uh, was he very pushy about it? Or oh yeah, c- kind of. Like yeah. he would be like at least once every two weeks, be like, "So do you want to start?" And I'm like, "Nah, I'm not putting the pajamas." Yeah. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then well, you do it for jujitsu now, so yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I end up doing it, so I end up putting the pajamas on. But um, yeah, it was it was weird because he he always wanted, and he would talk about fighting like all day. Yeah. Like. Uh, Kung Fu, Muay Thai, like, uh, besides MMA, MMA got big in Brazil, like, 2012, 2013, when, like, that was, like, big names, but he would talk about fighting all day, yeah. like, he could, at the time, he would, like, just talk about, like, Bruce Lee and be water. So, so he never got into Jiu-Jitsu, or? He did for a bit when I came to Australia, so, like, before, before I came to Australia, I was training in Brazil, and then that was one day I was, like, do you want to bet I can beat you in, like, <laughs> two minutes? And he was like, nah, you can't. And I was like, yeah, I, I do. I bet like, and I we bet like whoever lost would pay for the sushi and I. Yeah. And then it was like 30 seconds. I got him down with a really shit single leg, got him out, and then I tapped him. <laughs> you tapped your own dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, mind you, my, my dad is not old. My dad, at the time, he was like 43 years old. Okay. Now he's like 47, 46. Okay. So it's not like, oh, he's an old man. So he's a pretty, young, pretty yeah. young dad, right? So, yeah. So uh-huh. how old was he when he had you? 20. 20, wow. 20. Yeah, my mom was 20 as well. Like, yep. they're both pretty young. Like, I'm 25 now. Yeah. So, like, my mom is 47 now. My dad's 48. Wow. 48, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, it was like beating an old man. Yeah. You know but what, I mean? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 is, what did your mom think about all that? Well, when... Oh, when you, so when they... You, when you, oh, okay, sorry. Go. Because they, they split when I was really young. Oh, okay. So, they, okay. they do talk a lot, but... Yeah. Like, just as friends, like, they're not that close. Yeah. Because they broke up when I was, like, six. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. so, like, I don't really remember them together. Okay. Anything. So then, how uh, would was your time split between them then? Or how, how did you do that? Kind of was more like, because my dad work, worked with my granddad for, like, most of his life. Mm. So, because there was this thing with going to school in the morning and training and uh, in the afternoons, until I was 14 when I started working, was, like, I would go, my mom would, uh, wake up with us and then we would go to school my brother and I and then like we would wake up 6am go to school at 7 and then my dad would pick us up at around like 12 mm. and then we would go to his like because he was living in the next town next to us so we would go to his like my, my granddad's business and then I would go to training my brother would just be like doing nothing all day <laughs> or like just doing like anime and stuff like that watching stuff yeah and then in the, once I would finish training, he would pick me up and now we would wait for my mom to pick us up. Because my mom, we live in this town and my mom used to work in the same town until my dad was living. Okay. So then she would just pick us up and then we would go to her house. Yeah. And then during the week was pretty much like that. We would stay with my mom five days a week and then sleep at my dad's house like once or twice a week. Okay. Not much. Because we, we didn't really like uh, staying with my dad that much. Just okay. because like felt like more like home in, with my mom than, yeah, of course. than with my dad. Yeah, it's a very different feeling, right? Like, you know, I think, um, you know, us as guys, we're, we're probably not as, uh, uh, what's the right word? Organized and tidy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Freddie's, you want to pop in, Freddie? No, 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 no. I was just going to let you know, Jude's not coming in today. He's going to be solving. I know. We, we, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, he just messaged me to tell you. We, that. We, yeah. we were talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Jude. You know, this is like. Pussy. No, <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, no comment, no comment. So. <laughs> Yeah, he's uh he's 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 developing a bit of a habit of uh, escaping. Yeah, being on the podcast, it seems. Yeah, I noticed. So we'll have to uh, address that. <laughs> anyway, um, 
Yeah, so okay, uh, and so your brother was he? Is he older or younger? Younger, younger. Okay. He does look older than me since he was fifteen. He's really? Like he's because I'm what five six, five seven. Yeah, he's like six foot two. Oh, he's a big guy. Fuck, he's huge. Yeah, yeah. Compared to me, like he's he's yeah. huge. And then he always looked older than me. Once he turned fifteen, he was like full beard straight yeah. away. I was still trying to grow my. <laughs> and like he's like full beard from fifteen years old. <laughs> like what happened there? <laughs> yeah, he stole all the good genetics. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. At least, at least for the height and the beard. Yeah, and like the blue eyes and yeah. like looking like fucking. Yeah, your yeah. eyes are pretty like what green. Yeah, you're greenish. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. South of Brazil is very common. It's not that like uncommon having like yeah, like clear eyes. I okay. don't know how you say that in English. Like uh, bright, like bright colors or something. Yeah, bright colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so then, um, yeah. Uh, so going back to this story about you, <laughs> you tapping out your dad. Like, what, how did he respond to that? It was like. Gosh, this really works, eh? And I was like, yeah, I told you. And he's like, yeah, I thought I thought it was just, like, fake. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I told you it's not fake. And then somehow he forgot his uh, wallet that day, and I had to pay for the sushi anyways. Oh, I was like, okay. <laughs> he's still, yeah, dad. it's been five years that he owes me that sushi. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm a bit annoyed at it still. But it was, it was fun. He, he ended up st- uh, starting doing jujitsu for a little bit. But my dad has a... He got um, sci- a sciatic pain. Okay. So, like, he had to do surgery and everything, and he had to stop training for a year or so, and then he tried to do z- jiu-jitsu for, well, probably three, four months, and then his pain was really bad. He also has really bad knees. Like, it's something that runs in the family. Like, everyone has really bad knees. Mm. So he just couldn't do it. It was, okay. like, it was too much for him. So w- when you say it runs in the family, so what, what kind of problem do you get with the knees? Uh, my granddad, he... Um, my dad's granddad as well. They both had like, um, you know, you have the liquid in your knees between the, the kneecaps. Yep. Uh, that liquid eventually runs out in the family for some reason. Like okay. It just, and then it gets really sore. It gets really swollen, especially in winter. It's really hot. Yeah. So like in summer is easy, not that bad. But then when you're moving a lot with your knees, doing a lot of stuff with your knees, it gets, gets pretty bad. I don't really have... I'm, I was going to say I don't have knee problems, but I did like a full knee surgery. <laughs> so like, <laughs> I do have knee problems as well <laughs> for different reasons. <laughs> for different reasons, yeah, yeah. yeah. That one's probably just injury from training, right? Yeah, it was like a, a really big guy fell on my knee like doing a warm-up Ugh. and I just three ligaments went to space. Like yeah. MCL, ACL and LCL. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's oh. actually that's actually a fairly common way that people um get injured. It's not It's not actually when they're doing the takedown, it's when somebody else accidentally lands on them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that spatial awareness thing is is so important, especially, you know, with beginners or people that aren't as experienced, right? Yeah. Just and to know that, you know, when you fall, well, you don't want to have fall on somebody because yeah. you could damage somebody or you could damage yourself. So Yeah. yeah at the time, it was pretty bad because it was just a month before I was coming to Australia at the time. Mm. And then, like, this guy was, like, was literally less like a s- simple warm-up. So somehow he decided to jump. And he was 125 kilos. Yeah. So, like, went straight on the side of my knee. And then I, he kind of, like, lied down through my leg yeah. until I fell to the ground. And I was, like, I started crying because I was, like, oh, gosh, I'm not going to Australia. I could tell, like, it was a Bad. lot. It was, was eight pops. That yeah. I, at least that I can remember. was, like, pop, 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 pop. Oh, and I was, wow. like, ooh. Yeah, was, it, was, he, was he doing, like, a flying guard pull or something? Yeah, we were doing, like, a little drill. To, you're supposed to put the, um, the leg on the hip and then pull guard. Yeah. And somehow he jumped guard. Ugh. And then he jumped not high enough because I think because it was too big. Yeah. And instead of jumping on my hips, which I probably would be able to hold him. Yeah. So at the time it was lifting quite a bit and then jumped on your knee. Yeah. Straight on my knee. Ugh. So it was like it was it was pretty bad. It was yeah. pretty bad. I went to the to the doctors and then they were pretty much like, Yeah, your knee's really bad. Yeah. And then after I did like the MRI and everything, my doctor was like, You you need to do surgery. So Otherwise, yeah, wow. So, it, in it, how long did that take? That process, like, so how after that? So, you went to the doctor straight away, and then how long did it take them for them to? Oh yeah, so it took like ten days because they like um, they put like the leg stuff on my leg to like keep tight and everything, and then they said like once the swollen is down, we do the MRI. So it took ten days to do that. Once we did the MRI, MRI, um, I went to the doctors again, and then he looked. Do you want to do surgery? Because like you're going to Australia and blah blah. I was like, yeah, I need to do surgery because. I knew I would like work with stuff that I need to lift and like heavy stuff. So I was like, yeah, I need to do the surgery before I go. And then took probably like a month to do the surgery after the the injury. Yep. And then once we did the surgery, it took me two months to start training again. Yeah, well. Like was way too quick. Like yeah. it was, was dumb. Yeah. I shouldn't have done. But like I had like in two months, I did 75 sessions of uh, physio. 
Okay. So then I had like full mobility of my knee. So you really, yeah, focused on trying to get better. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I was, because I wasn't working at the time and the knee, uh, the knee surgery happened because I was coming to Australia in June 2019 mm -hmm. and then it, that happened in May. Yeah, okay. So it was just a month before I had to cancel my flights, cancel my visa, had to repay for visa and flights. Yep. And then, because I wasn't working because I quit my job before I came, mm. I was just like, all right, I'm going to do as much physio as I can and try to take care of my body as much as I can. Yep. And then it was like, it was a quick recover, but mm. like not fully recover. But I would say I was probably like 85% at the time. Yeah. And start training again, but very light. Yep. And then by the end of the year, I was training like full time again because in Brazil, my job was pretty chill. So yep. I was training full time for the first year. Yeah, I think I think people uh, underestimate uh, their body's capacity to heal, especially if you're doing the work, right? Like if you're doing the physio or you're doing like you're, you're massaging it and you're doing all these sorts of things to try and get it better. Yeah. Um, your body can actually, you know, heal a lot faster than you think, yeah. right? Yeah. Like a, I think a lot of the times people get like a knee injury and then they're like, they just sit on the sidelines for extended periods of time and they go, oh yeah, it's still not right. Yeah. And, and they just, you know, that... Become that six weeks recovery turns into like six months recovery. Exactly. And, and they're still complaining that it's not right. Yeah. And my physio, the guy that I was doing with, he was, uh, he only treat athletes. Mm. So he was like, dude, I can, I can get you back on training in two months, but you're going to have to do a lot of work. And when I say back on training, I'm not saying like, you're going to be like doing fly arm bars and stuff. <laughs> you're going to be on the mats. Yeah. Like washing the claws and like be, yeah, be able to move a little bit. And I was like, okay, that's what I need. Yeah. I need to look something like, in the future like that that's my goal i just need to get back on the mats yeah i was it was pretty good the guy was amazing Diego, he was like he was with me every day so we create like a good friendship as well and dude like it's been five years since that happened and i still talk to him like at least once every two weeks or something like that because oh, yeah. i always giving him like uh dude my knees is bad and he's like stop training I'm like i can't <laughs> 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 so he's, he's quite annoyed at me because like i'm always like you're jeeing him up yeah i always telling him like how bad my like my entire body is and he's like just give yourself like a week and i'm like, oh, sorry i can't bro. Yeah, just I, I, need, I need to train <laughs> all right so um let's go back a bit so when it came to to school and things like that like what was school like in brazil for you boring, boring. like it's, it's school in brazil is like I, I don't know if it's because, like, I did, like, TAFEs in Australia and I find the the educational system here in Australia a little bit weird for me. Yeah. I feel like it doesn't really work that much. Really? Yeah, I feel like it's a bit outdated. So, hang on, hang on. Um, what did you study in, at TAFE here? Uh, I did fitness. Yep. So, I did certificate three and four and then, like, to become a PT. I just finished diploma in business and I'm finishing advanced diploma in leadership and management. Yep. But I feel like the way, I don't know if it's because TAFE is like that. You do like assessments and it's pretty much based on that. If you do well on the assessments, you, you're fine. Which I feel like is a bit weird because you're basically studying through one paper. Yeah. Like like 80 pages, but still like it's one paper. Yeah. And in, uh, in Brazil, it's a little bit different. You have like you have like your assessments, but you also have like important tests that you do through, uh, through the year. And sometimes if you did really well the first... Uh, semester, uh, trimester, trimester, like semester, half sem year or third of the year, third of the year, third of the year will be a trimester. Yeah, trimester. So, like, if you do really well in the first part of the year, you, and you did really bad in the second two parts, you're still gonna fail. Yep. So you can't just do like well in one or two. You need to do well in All the three it. parts. Hmm. And in Brazil, it's pretty much for everything, and we divide that on science, uh, mathematics, Portuguese. We don't really do English until you go to high school hmm. or Spanish. And then history and stuff like that. So you need to do well in all of them. And if you fail in any of the subjects, you, you fail the year and you need to repeat. Wow. So it's like, it's very different. Yep. But it's not amazing as well. I say like, oh, uh, it's different from Australia, but I think like both systems are be like outdated, to be honest. <laughs> like there is better ways to learn. Yeah. At least I believe so. Yeah. So then, okay. Um, to sort of pick your brain in terms of there's better ways to learn. Like, so what, what do you, ha uh, you obviously, you know, mean that, You've done some self-learning for yourself, right? Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, quite a bit. so what? Do you, how do you how do you pick things up? How do you learn? For me, like I can I can learn in different ways. You know, like you can learn like visually, and you can learn like through audio. Oh yeah, good for tea. You can. I feel like for me, the the best way for me to learn is like through visually, yeah. and like I need to. I need to understand why I'm learning something. I can't just learn something for the sake of learning, which I feel like school usually is like that. Yeah. You're just learning for the sake of it. And someone tells you, oh, you need to learn that. And then once you finish your school, you never see that again. And then I feel like for me, every time... We might have missed maybe a few minutes there, but anyway, we're uh, back. No so 
Uh, what were we saying? We're talking about learning. Yeah. So when it came, when it comes to learning things, so what 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 do you like? Well, what's your style of learning? Yeah, like for me, I need to read and write it down back again if I'm learning something that is a little bit more specific. Mm-hmm. Not as like for jujitsu because I feel like it's a lot of body movement and it's a lot of feeling. Yep. But when I'm studying something like now, I'm starting to learn t- um, IT because I want to see if I can do something like working from home a little bit more. Yep. So I feel like for me, I need to see it, hear it, and like write it back down. Yep. And then just get my own time to like re, re review everything. I feel like in Brazil, at least the way we do it is like the first part of the you, you see something, and by the end of it, you never see it again. Yeah. And then you just completely forget. It. And then the next year, you don't even remember what you saw in the beginning of the or even the middle of the last year, which is it's like, what's the point of even learning if you're not going to remember? You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. But I feel like you need to keep reviewing everything that you learn. So you always do a little back step. You do one, two, three. And then you go back to one and then four, five, six, go back to two. Mm. So you always keep reviewing everything you learn. I know it's not like, it's a bit hard with uh, when you're doing that like for 40 people in a class because usually classes in Brazil is like 30 to 40 kids, mm. which is a lot of people. And everyone learns a little bit in a different way. But also you learn a bit of everything and sometimes it's quite overwhelming. And you basically just trying to finish the year. You're not trying to learn anything. And pretty much my whole academic uh, psych in Brazil was kind of like that. Like I just tried to finish this year and then I worry about next year. Mm. But like, because I didn't have problems to learn the way they teach, I was like kind of like cocky with like the instructors and everything. I would be like, you don't even know what you're talking about. You just like, you're just reading a paper and I'm going to read back to you and you're going to be like, oh yeah, you know what I know now. Yeah. You can go next year. Which I think like, it's, it's a bit useless. Yeah. Most of the information that you get from high school or even like preschool, you don't remember. Yeah. Like well, it's it's a weird one, right? Because it's sort of like, it, it's so, uh, I guess, you know, when you become an adult, you sort of look back on it and you think it's so basic yeah. that you sort of take it for granted. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, if you if you didn't actually grab or grasp some of those concepts, um, they would really make it difficult for you to understand other things. Yeah. You know, yeah. like even like, mm, I guess... You know, and I, I'm speaking about this just because I, I see it with my own kids, right? Like uh, modeling language, like how to say something or how to say this particular sentence. And you're trying to get, you know, a child to repeat it back to you in the same way. You know, it's, it's difficult for them, you know, they, yeah. it, 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 but we take it for granted. And then, you know, if you don't um, address and try and correct some of these things as you go, then they actually become like learning disadvantages in the future, right? Like yeah. they struggle to pick up things. Because I think, you know, there's a real like the difference between somebody who can uh, pick something up quickly and somebody who takes a long time to pick it up is that ability to sort of um, infer understanding from based on previous ex- experience, yeah. right? So it's like, okay, um, you know, I've seen this particular thing before. Let's say it's like, you know, we're talking about a fruit or whatever. Um, so we can infer some characteristics about what it is. You know, do you eat the skin? Do you not eat the skin? You know, yeah. um, if I've eaten a mango before, and then I'm eating a pineapple, like, you know, you can sort of, there's some similarities, even though the taste is very different. Yeah. Right. And then like, you know, uh, so some of those concepts, like they really translate over very, very quickly. Um, and that's why it's like, you know, if you, um, for you, you know, having done capoeira and having tried all these different things, and then you go into like, you do s- even just like say doing f- uh, football or soccer and then going into jujitsu, like they all actually translate and they help you. Yeah. Um, yeah. versus if you were somebody that had never done anything physical, and then you try and go into a sport like jujitsu, it would be very difficult. Yeah, yeah, because right? you have no like body awareness or yeah. like mobility. Yeah, even so right, it's that coordination. Yeah. yeah, you don't really know how to do it. I just feel like for me, like the problem with the system the way we do in Brazil is a lot of stuff that. But I feel like in Australia is is similar to that. Like you don't really learn things that you could use more once you get out of your like you go get your first job, mm. and like especially in high school, I felt like in Brazil, my most of my high school was a bit of a waste. It was just. I felt like my high school was just to try to get into uni mm. because everything you're learning is, is about it in a test that you do in Brazil. And then if you do well, you can go to any uni you want. And I did pretty well. I, I got two scholarships in Brazil, which was pretty good. Yeah, I okay. ended up never doing it. Like I went to the first week and I decided to come to Australia. But <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> hey, hey, stop, stop. <laughs> We're going to talk about this. So, okay, so what did, you stu- what did you study in high school? In high school or yeah. in uni? Oh, so in, in high school before you got to uni, so... All right, so in high school in Brazil, you can't really choose what you're studying. So it's still the same thing for everyone. Mm. So a little bit of everything. Pretty much like 
you do like in preschool and everything. Okay. So, so it's science, set subjects, English yeah. or like Brazilian, English, math, exactly. science. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Okay. And then when you go to do this test in Brazil that we call it name, is like if you do really well, you get into uni and then you get a, go- a good scholarship or sometimes you can get like a, at least a part uh, part scholarship. Like okay. they pay half of it for you. And so then so who, who organizes the scholarship thing? Because that, like in Australia, right, like to get a scholarship, like typically it's like a, some kind of a program and you'll have to like, uh, not only do you have to get the marks for it, you have to apply and do like an interview process and all this. Is it like that in Brazil? Or? No, you don't have to do an interview process. It's pretty much like once a year we have this big exam that is a name and it's take care of, like the government takes care of it. Okay. So if you do well and there is like a, a certain amount of people that can get the scholarship on that year, and then if you do well, you get a scholarship and the government pays for it. Full full price. Mm. Doesn't really matter what he's studying. But every, of course, like if you're trying something that there is more people applying for, like uh, medicine or dentist or um, engineering in general, it's harder to get. So you need like a better score. And then if you're doing things that are a little bit like easier, easier in a way to get in, because there's not as many people trying to get into, like business or um, administration and stuff like that, is a little like the the mark that you need to get is a bit lower. So usually it's around like 700 for anything that you're doing. So okay. if you're going to the easiest scholarship that you can get, a minimum would be 700 of a thousand. And that's based on, you're pretty much gonna do a test with everything, history, mathematics, Portuguese, English and Spanish. The part of English and Spanish is super easy to be honest, cause like they know like most of the things you're doing is gonna be in Portuguese anyways. Mm. And then the biggest one it would be like Portuguese because you need to do like um you need to write an essay of like thirty uh thirty lines. It's not like it's like one full page. Okay. But it's based on whatever they decide on that year and you have no idea what it is gonna be about it until you, you do the test. Okay. So it's like a surprise thing. Yep. So every year you change the subject and then you need to do really well. And I was really I was pretty lucky that at the time was things that I was into it. Mm. The the three times I did twice. I did no. I did three times. I did one before I finished high school, and then the only problem with this test is if you do before you finish high school, you can use that to not go to high school anymore because you, it's a test based on high school. Oh. So let's say you do the first year and you're 16 years old. Once you finish, if you do well on the test, you don't have to. You can like just apply and not go to high school anymore and pretty much like finish your year. Like you do like year 11, 12 here. Sometimes yeah. you don't finish year 12. In Brazil, to not finish and you still get the grading of like high school you need to do that test and do really well could you go to uni from there as well no because oh, okay. you so need you to choose do it again yeah you need to f- choose between finishing high school or going to uni but you can only go to uni once you finish high school okay so it's kind of like you need to so it forces you to do it another two years yeah yeah pretty much or you go get out of high school and you go back the next year do the same test yeah you don't need to be in high school to do the test like my mom did when she was 30, and she got a scholarship as well. Wow, okay. Yeah, cause and so, so when, when you say a scholarship, so the, the government obviously pays for everything? For everything. Do you have to pay them back? No. No. No, so it's, it's full, full scholarship. Full scholarship. Yeah. Wow, okay. Which is... That's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So then, okay, so then uh, what would... Did you know what you wanted to study when you finished high school? Mm, at the time, no, because uh, when I was doing high school, I was doing high school in the morning. I got up... Once I turned 14 was when I got into high school. Mm. I finished... I would finish high school at like 11.30 and I would go to a part-time job in the Ivo. And then at night I would do a TAFE. So I did a uh, building engineer kind of thing. Mm. So like I can, it's kind of like an architecture thing, but mm. for not a bachelor, it's pretty much a TAFE. Yep. And I did at the same time I was doing high school. Okay. So whoa, 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 whoa. So F- yeah. F14, how do you decide to do all this? Oh, I didn't decide. My, my dad was like, I did some pretty... Um, before I got into high school, there was a day that I decided to bring alcohol to the school. Okay. But like, I, I brought like this much and the next day is everyone was like, oh, let's bring alcohol. And then because I brought one day, like was honestly, wasn't even a sip. It was something that I found in my fridge and I was like, oh, that would be fun. The guy's gonna like it. And then the next day, everyone decided to bring a lot of alcohol to And like, keep in mind, everyone was like 12, 13 at the time. Yeah. So then the school got really mad about it and they called my parents on and they were like, because everyone b- decided to just blame me. Like, I didn't even bring the data. <laughs> like, the school found out that people had alcohol in school. I didn't even bring anything. Yeah. And then everyone decided to be like, oh, it was Gabriel's idea. So I pretty much took the blame for everything. And then my dad was like, you're going to have to do, like, 
pay for something. You're not just doing high school next year, like, and you're not playing soccer, like, the end of the season. I was like, what? <laughs> How come? Like, I didn't even do anything that bad. Like, honestly, no one would even get drunk with what I did. And then at the time, I didn't understand. Like, I, I was a bit, like, delusional about it. And I ended up having to do, he was like, you need to do this TAFE. But the TAFE, I had to pay for it. So that's why I got a part-time job <laughs> okay. to pay for it. <laughs> so then I was studying in the morning high school, part-time job in the Avo, And then I, and I would do like my TAFE, like uh, 6 to 9.30. No, I was like 5 to 9.30, something like that. Yep. And then I did that for three years. It was the same time that I did high school. For high school was three years. Wow. And so what were you, um, uh, when you were working, what was the part-time job? Like where were you working? My first job in Brazil was uh, my auntie had like um she used to bring stuff from China and resell to uh, sellers, uh, like to stores and stuff. That was pretty much mops, you know, like the the mops that you used to mop the, the ground. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So she used to bring those, and my job was pretty much take everything from a truck in a uh, container in the morning and put it back in the truck in the. Oven. That's it. That's it. And that was my job for like two years. <laughs> And I, he re- I really hate it. <laughs> How much were you getting paid to do that? So literally Pretty just much nothing. Carrying, carrying mops on and off the truck. Yeah, it was like $2. Shit. Like a, no, not even that. <laughs> but like it was really shit. And then it, was really, it wasn't hard on my body because mops are light. But yeah. like it was a boring job. I yeah. didn't have like any expectation of keep doing that. It was just to pay for my TAFE. And then after two years, I got a job with like um, uh, a drafters, drafters person. Like I used to draft stuff for like uh, outcut and stuff like that. Yep. And it was like with fire prevention. And then later on, I ended up like staying in this job for like four, four or five years, ended up becoming like a project manager over there and then did like, um, it was all based on fire prevention. Mm. So I did um, also a course to become a firefighter and everything in Brazil. Oh, wow. Yeah, quite. A, I did quite a, a bit in my early like 14 to 18. I, I did a lot. Yeah. And then when I finally got this scholarship, I did, um, I decided to do environment engineer. Yep. I did for a week and I was like, mm, I don't like it. I'm, I'm going to Australia. I, I, already, I already had the plan to leave the country. So, but why Australia? Like, of all places to, to pick? Oh, honestly, it was just um, occasionally I was I was doing like English once a week in Brazil. Yeah. And the guy that was the conversation instructor, he was Australian, Jake. And I was telling him, oh, I'm thinking about going to Canada because I can transfer my scholarship over there. But then I also didn't want to go there because it's, it's cold. Yeah, and like I'm from Brazil, like I, I, <laughs> l- I love the the hot weather. Yeah, and then I was thinking about going to Ireland because was an easy option, it was cheaper as well, way cheaper than coming to Australia. Yep, like less than half of the price. Wow. But then when I spoke to Jake and he was showing me stuff about Australia, I was like, you know what? Yeah, fuck it, I'm going to Australia. Yeah. And then I was doing uni, I didn't like it. I, were, I already started Jiu Jitsu in Brazil, and I was loving it. And then. There was one day I was watching this movie and I was like, you know what? Yeah, that's it. I'm I'm leaving the country. The next day I ended up signing up like the the contract with the agency and they did all the paperwork for me. I just had to pay everything and then yeah. And so then so okay, you make the decision to go to Australia. Do you just say, hey mom, hey dad, I'm I'm moving to Australia? Or? Uh, they they knew I wanted to leave the country for a while because okay. since when I started working when I was 14, I started saving half of my money was just to like leave the country. Okay. I had a saving account and actually I have a new saving account saying like leave the country. <laughs> I'm leaving the country. <laughs> but I started a saving account, leave the country for like four years. Mm. And I was like just putting money like religiously every month. Yeah, That amount is for leaving the country. And then when finally I decided to go, I was like, gosh, I don't have enough money. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just worked really hard and did quite a few things to like make extra cash and I save enough. And then, so was that, you know, drive to leave the country just because uh, you figured there'd be more opportunities in Australia or was it just... Yeah, I never, I, I always felt like I, I need to leave the country and like see things. I, I never really enjoyed Brazil. I was always a bit, a bit depressed in Brazil. Okay. Not like depressed like, to the point I can't do stuff or I can't enjoy life here. It's more like I don't see my life in Brazil. It's yeah. like I, I don't feel home here, mm. which is weird because... You grew up there. Yeah, yeah. And I never felt like home. Not there is like specific moments of my life that are like, oh, this this feels nice. Like yeah. feels like feels home. Yeah. But in general, I never felt like home in yeah. Brazil. And I always wanted to try go somewhere else and travel for a little bit. But I have this thing. I don't want to just travel in holidays. I like to get to know people. I like to work in the culture. I like to like get myself into what the country does. Mm, so experience it. Yeah. 
like I don't feel like it's the full experience if you n- just in the holidays. Yeah. Because you have that fair tale in your head, like oh, it's gonna be amazing because last time I was there, I was drinking all day, I was training all day, or <laughs> doing stuff like that, and I feel like it's not realistic, yeah. at least not in the long run. Mm. So that's why I was like, I, I need to leave and experience different things. And then when I heard about Australia, it sounded pretty good. I heard everyone's pretty tall here, and I was like, yeah, that that sounds that sounds nice. Like <laughs> people are tall, they look like they love life over there. Of course, when you get here, like it's not it's not as they sell to you, but yeah. it's still like compared to Brazil, I feel feels way more like home than than in Brazil. Yeah, well, all right. Before we move on from Brazil, I, I gotta ask about um, about this because I remember one of our conversations, and uh, you know, we're just talking about social media, and you you brought up that you know uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at yeah. one stage you were dating some Brazilian influencer or something. I gotta ask the question. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> tell me about that. Like, yeah, like um, I had a first girlfriend in Brazil when I was thirteen. She was also thirteen. Yeah. And then we date for a year and then we broke up. And then after that, I was like, I'm never dating again. And I was, honestly, I was 13. Yeah. Like 14 at the time we broke up. I was like, I'm never dating someone again. Two months after I met this girl. <laughs> <laughs> and she had like, she had a few followers already. She had like probably like 20,000 at the time. Yeah. And I remember like telling my friends, dude, she looks like Lana Del Rey. <laughs> and I was in love with Lana Del Rey at the time. I was like 15, 14. And then... I sent a message to her and then we started talking and then she was telling me like she was trying to become like get more followers and like get more famous and blah blah blah. I was like, oh, that that's cool. I don't send anything about it. I I had like one photo on Instagram. I was like, it was something random. It wasn't even me. <laughs> I had like 150 followers or something like that. It was like just friends and people and she had already like 20 and at the time like that was 2013, 2014. Pretty early on, yeah. So like just when Instagram was like, getting like really big. And then uh, we started dating, seeing each other. And right after we started dating, she started getting a lot of followers because people would repost her photos. And then she got to, I would say, like, at the time, 120K, 140K maybe. Yeah. But, like, her life was just, like, taking photos and, like, that that was her life. Just taking photos and posting. And so, like, I guess I'm a bit curious about this because, you know, when somebody says to you, and this is your partner at the time, you know, I want to be, like, a... I guess she wanted to be like an influencer, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so when you guys would go on like dates and stuff, would she just be always taking photos? Yeah, of everything. Everything. And because like we were both like teenagers at the time, like I would go to her house on the weekends and like her parents love me. I love them. I still talk to her mom until nowadays. Really? Yeah, it's been five years since we broke <laughs> up. I still talk to you. I still talk to her at least like four times a year. Because like when she has a birthday or I have a birthday or holidays or stuff like that, we always talk. I, I love her like the ball but uh at the time i would go to her house on the friday night or on a saturday day and stay until sunday but the saturday would be all day eight hours of photos no way and i hate it i hate it and were you the guy always having to take the photos yeah, yeah. <laughs> like so it's like i was the person taking photos you just yeah, with a camera. And I'm like and for like eight hours <laughs> yeah every saturday and we we have two days to see each other. And then the one, one day, day is just me taking photos. And the other part of the day is her editing the photos and making posts and then posts and not liking. And like, oh, I don't like this one. I'm going to delete it. And her entire life was based on that. Wow. At the time, at least. And then because she was taking a lot of photos, she started taking photos of me at the time. I, like, I had like a really long hair. I kind of looked like a little bit like my style was kind of like Harry Styles from One Direction. So then she was just like posting stuff about me all the time as well. And then because she had a lot of followers, I got quite a few followers. Yeah. And then it was like four years of that and I was over it. And I was like, her life was pretty much like I go to high school in the morning, go back home and take photos all day. And I was like already like grinding. It was like I was 14, working already, doing yeah. TAFE and I, I didn't have time for anything. And then once I started doing Jiu Jitsu, it was even worse because then I was like, I don't even want to go see you on a on the weekends because what are you going to do take photos yeah like <laughs> i need i need to train it's on such Saturday. a massive disconnect isn't it yeah it was like it was very like like we, we were good together we weren't like a bad couple yeah but like we were also teenagers so yeah you can't really count that no, as a yeah. full relationship cause yeah it was four years but it was like we see each other like twice a, twice twice a week. week yeah yeah it's a yeah i always uh find that to be an interesting thing because you know there's when you have like a a massive following um there's a real disconnect there between, you know, what life is like in reality versus what life is like online. Right. And so, you know, you, you're seeing on the other end, you know, like to her followers, they're going, Oh, 
she must have the best life. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, and then meanwhile, you know, Gabe's there eight hours grinding away. <laughs> his fingers, his fingers gone all blistered from pushing the, <laughs> pushing the button on the camera. It was, it was pretty much like that. Like, yeah. and honestly, I felt like, because she had like, like I wasn't rich in Brazil, like not even close to that. Like my family, my mom's family side was very poor at the beginning of like my mom's life and everything. And then mm. my dad's life was a bit better than my mom's, but like, not like that we have a lot of things to like, my mom, like, at least until when I started working, we were, like, living paycheck by paycheck mm. because, like, didn't have much. And then her life was very different. She had, like, a stable family. Her parents were still together. My family were, like, at the time, I was already 15, so they were, they had it split for 10 years at the time. And then her family was, like, had lots of friends with the family and everyone was, like, very close together, which was very different from my family at the time. So it was like it was a bit like very like I'm I'm living on eight and she was living on eighty like yeah. very different complete different like lifestyles, which was good because gave me like a little bit of a, like a inside of like a a different perspective of life because my friends were pretty much the same as me mm. they had like parents were split um, they stay a little bit with their mom stay a little bit with their dad some of them they wouldn't even see their dad for like years and stuff like that so it was good to see like a normal functional family mm. do you think uh, i'm cur- curious about this like uh does that shape the way that you view relationships for yourself like what you want out of a relationship in the future oh uh, at that time that one did for a bit not compared to like my last relationship i know we're <laughs> gonna we'll talk about that, that <laughs> <laughs> but uh at the time because i was young and i was like was just hanging out i didn't have like that much of like oh it's not like we in love it's not like oh we're gonna like get married yeah because from the beginning she already told me like oh i want to have kids when i'm 27 and blah blah and i was thinking dude i'm, I'm 15 yeah I, i'm not having That's kids 12 years. <laughs> yeah like i'm not having kids and then i still think like i'm not gonna have kids but i don't know and then but at the time i was like i'm never having kids mm. and her dream was to have kids one day mm. so i was like oh this relationship has like a deadline i don't know when but we're definitely gonna break up one day from yeah. the beginning so i was like it was good to hang out with her i like her family like her mom cooked so well mm. <laughs> my mom doesn't know how to cook properly <laughs> or she doesn't speak english so it's not she a problem <laughs> <laughs> sorry mom <laughs> so yeah sorry mom uh i cook better than her for sure uh, but at the time i was like I, I at least knew i didn't want it to be with an influencer it wasn't me i i try to post a little bit more now because like live in the country and like i want to live doing jiu-jitsu i know it's important to have like social media mm. but it's not really me like i don't don't really enjoy the yeah like photos and videos it c- kind of traumatized me a little bit like with the whole thing of like you need to be taking photos all day you need to be yeah. posting you need to make like that's why i lost like gosh i probably lost like 15 to 20 uh followers okay like like during the time that we broke up wow. because i lost 5k as soon we broke up Yep. And then I stopped posting for like three years. So yeah. I didn't post anything and I just saw my followers dropping and dropping and dropping. And then there was a time that I was like, oh gosh, I can use that for one day. So then I started posting again. I was like, I need to at least try to keep the ones I have right now. Yes. Yeah. Well, th- there'll also be a little bit of a um, a transition as well in, in that follower base. Like I think oh, yeah. one of the things people don't think about, like, um, you know, and I, I can only speak to this because, you know, I've, I've got, like, these side accounts that nobody knows that I really got. Because I've never mentioned what the, what the names are and things like that. But, like, one's, like, 160K. One's, yeah. like, they're, they're decent amounts, right? And so um, I did I did recently actually just switch one over for, for a business that I've got going on. So, you know, that, that follower base will adjust, right? Yeah. And it's bound to lose some followers. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. I'm not really too worried about that. But, it, you know, I'd rather have a head start and have, you know, 18,000 followers and start from zero that's and have what to build i it back up right that was the same thing i thought so it's, just, it's the same thing right like you you know at least you're starting from you're not starting from zero again yeah because it's much harder once once you start from the from zero ground yeah because I, I taught myself like all right the followers i have right now at the time when i start posting again i was like it's people from 16 years old to 25 mm. and they into cute guys with long hair <laughs> i'm posting about jujitsu now yeah <laughs> it's a complete like <laughs> the demographic shift. yeah it's completely different and now when because i i still have the like the um the business account yeah so i can see like what is my follow base and if i had i don't have a print from when i was younger yeah but if i had a print you would see like because went from like 89 percent girls yeah to like 
70 percent guys now <laughs> so it's like it's, it's i'm like uh, just like people that love see me hugging people yeah like and before you'd be like just people want to see my long hair yeah and stuff like that yeah total shift right yeah completely yeah, yeah. Out, of, out of curiosity you know did she make much money from oh me? yeah quite yeah? a bit she did quite well yeah she was doing well and then she decided to sell her instagram which i thought was dumb wow and the first time i was like dude don't do that and then so she sold like for like two thousand dollars whoa which is nothing she had like 150k and she was getting stuff all the time but she already had to start a new account okay so she had the the new account had like 70k okay so she was posting both and then she decided to sell the 150 140k whatever it was and then she sold that and then uh, do you know what that that account became <laughs> oh yeah like i think i actually a few weeks ago i was trying to go to like my first uh message because i still had a message with that account and now it's like 50k not even that wow yeah because i think that person sold as well and then just kept trying to make some money out of it yeah but at the time she used to make a bit of money and she used to get like stuff for free all the time which i thought was amazing mm. like we would get pizza we would get sushi on the weekends i would be like okay Taking eight hours photos is not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> that was a <laughs> low expectations, right? Yeah. So if you actually work it out, though, okay, game. Like yeah. <laughs> if you had just gone to, to actually buy the sushi, it might have only been 50 bucks. So it was 50 bucks for eight hours worth of work. <laughs> yeah, I was like, all right, it's not that but, bad. Not that. <laughs> and I get a few shirts here and there. So like, because yeah. sometimes they would ask us, would ask her to do posts with me. Uh, like, always oh, nice. a couple camp campaign or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So then I would get stuff for free as well. Yeah. I got like only like two sponsorships through my account and yep. i was like best day of my life and then when i had to take the photos i was like i hate this yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i never like tried to get another sponsorship i was like and every time someone would um, reach out and be like do you want to do a sponsorship no 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 i don't do it that yeah. you talk to my ex <laughs> yeah and it's, 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 it's actually work right like i think i think people don't realize that yeah. it is work and sometimes you don't even make that much money yeah. to be honest i most of like the sponsorships that i got was just like for exposure so they would give me stuff and i would expose them Mm. And also, I was like, That's they weren't actually giving you any money. It no, was just yeah, like, like they some just product. Said, they, yeah, they sent me like a t shirt or they sent me like this uh, cool stuff or like something like that. So it wasn't really worth it for me. For her, it was worth it. For me, it wasn't like maybe, if, sorry, maybe if I had work a little bit more and tried to do it, maybe I don't know. Yeah, wasn't me. I wouldn't, do. yeah, yeah. It's a it's hard if it doesn't resonate with your personality, right? Because, um, yeah, like I said, it, it is work. Like to build those other accounts that I had, it was it took time every day, yeah. you know, and you have to be disciplined about it. Yeah, you can't just you know? like post randomly. The the algorithm doesn't like it. Yeah, you need to be like on point. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was it was pretty interesting because actually one of the accounts that I got that that took off significantly happened just before, what is is in October twenty two, when I was like really uh, like I was just doing it at the time to sort of prove a point that I could do it. Oh yeah, and um, it was funny because I was with um. Uh, I was fighting on XSC and so I was with Renato and Percy and uh, we were in the same room and then I was uh, like, yeah, Cass and I think Mirko came up as well. And then we, yeah, when we, when we were in the room, like I was showing Percy and uh, Coach Renato and I was like, oh, hey, look at this account, right? And mm -hmm. I was like, I think it was only like 17,000 on the first day. Oh, yeah. And then uh, we were in Brisbane for like maybe three days or something. So, and then on the third day I said, hey, look at this, it's at 35 already. Fuck. It just like just went from seventeen to thirty five, and then yeah. like a week later, it was like fifty five, and then in like three weeks, then it got to like hundred thousand. Yeah, uh, and then it was weird. It had like a, a, a like something in, must have changed in the algorithm or something because I, I think I got to like one hundred twenty or something, and then it just like died. Yeah, and I was like, oh, nothing's happening. And then um, after like another, I think it, then it was a, about a month later, then it took off again, and I got it to one sixty, and then I actually. I haven't really posted on that account since I've just got it oh, yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, if you want to keep growing, you need to keep posting all yeah. the time and people sure. get engaged with it. But yeah. It's but hard. It's, yeah, it was just one of those things like, you know, okay, I, n I know how to do it now. Yeah. it's yeah. I've learnt, I've learned what I needed and then I've just sort of parked it. And then, yeah. you know, I could probably sell it, but I, yeah, I've never really thought about it. I just leave it. And one day if I want to use it for something, I can use you it. Can I've got a base, right? Yeah, you can always change back to something else. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, all right, let's, let's talk about like making that um, – that trip to Australia oh, yeah. and, uh, and then, you know, so what happened when you first got here? Gosh, my, f my first day in Australia was a bit like, was actually pretty cool. <laughs> but like I got here because like I couldn't, it was a 53 hours flight. So it was 53 hours. So yeah. you had to, where did they fly you first? So I went from South of Brazil to Sao Paulo, which is in the middle of Brazil. Yep. And then I had a layover of like seven hours in just in Brazil. Yeah. And then I five hours flight to Chile. And then I had another like, 
15 to 16 hour layover in Chile. Wow. And then the flight to Australia was because it was one directly flight from Chile was 15 hours flight. <laughs> so like all together ended up being like 53 hours. But because I couldn't sleep, because my flight, my first flight in Brazil was like 2 a.m. I didn't sleep since like I didn't have like any sleep the day before. Mm. So I didn't sleep for like two days. And I was like, because I couldn't sleep in Chile, I was like, someone's going to steal my bags or like, I'm going to fall asleep and I'm going to lose the flight. <laughs> like I was dead, like anxious about it. And was then, that the first time you'd ever gone overseas? Oh, it was the first time I catch a plane basically. Yeah. Okay. Like I, I got like two planes before that and was to Rouge in there. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and like it was a really long flight. So then when I got in the flight to Australia, I forgot to text my mom, I'm getting the flight. So I was like, she's going to freak out because I wasn't, I wasn't going to reply her for 15 hours. At the time, my head was like, oh, she's going to call the cops and stuff like that. But I was just super anxious. So I asked one of the, the flight attendants if I could just leave the <laughs> the airplane to like text my mom. And she was like, "You once you get in, you can't leave. I was like, but my mom is going to be really mad. <laughs> and then she let me like get like step out of the airplane, send my message and I got back in and then I fell asleep straight away. Yeah, I didn't even see the f the plane taking off or anything. When I woke up, it was already Sydney. Yeah, wow. Like it was, I was seeing like the the Harbour Bridge. Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm I'm in Sydney yeah. now. Yeah, and then I got out, get like a few stuff because I didn't have anyone at, at the time here in Sydney that I knew. Yeah, like I had two friends and they were both in Bali, <laughs> so I was like, I don't even have a place to crash properly. I got a hostel for two weeks. That was all I had. I paid off in Brazil when I got the hostel, but I only had like eight hundred bucks. Okay. With me. And then I got here. I caught the the train to like the Kingsford, mm. you know, like it w where it was my hostel at the time. I stayed at the hostel for like a week and was horrible. There was like I love French people. Don't I'm not saying that, but like the French people <laughs> that were with me, they were horrible. <laughs> Why? What, what did they do? They didn't want to shower. They didn't. They would really? smoke cigarettes all day, and they would talk in French even they knew fucking English. Mm. So I would talk to them in English. They would look at me and reply in French. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes I would see them speaking English. That was, I was like, oh, you guys know. English, like, yeah. Like you just not, purposely speaking you just French don't back want to me. You don't want to talk yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> so then I left that place. I did like my RSA, my white card. I did a bunch of jobs in the first year because I got here just December 2019. Mm. And then right after was like- COVID, right? COVID. Yeah. So and what like jobs did you do? What, did you, what jobs did you get to do before you- uh, I did removal list, like uh, moving furniture from houses. Definitely the worst job I ever did. Because <laughs> you get like the people complaining like in hospitality because like it's their house. Yeah. But then you also get the hard work of like lifting shit. Actually you have to do something. So you yeah. get like the the worst two things that you can do in Australia. Yeah. Which is like talking to people. <laughs> and, uh, and lifting heavy shit. <laughs> yeah, and lifting heavy shit. And putting in a truck and you never know. Like sometimes you get to a job and like, oh, it's going to be like a three hours job and up being like a 16 hours job. It happened like at least 10 times with me where they would be like, dude, don't worry. It's going to be an easy job. And get there is like, is a 12 day hour shift. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I have stuff to do. Like I had plans after this. I had like another job to go. Yeah. And you're there, gotta, you got to carry it upstairs. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I, I'm here. I need to do it. And then I did that. I work in a nightclub in Oxford Street yep. and Stonewall. <laughs> Definitely the funniest job I ever had. Why? Because like the gay people are fucking amazing. Like, cause it's like it's a gay bar, so like everyone is gay there. Like there was only me and another guy that were gay working in the bar. Everyone else was gay. Yeah. And it was like it was actually the best time. Like working that bar was definitely the nicest restaurant I ever worked because everyone is like happy there. It's not like you go to a restaurant and you get like clients that are annoyed and they they come to complain. No, they go there because they want to have fun. Yeah, and then it was was really nice. Like the vibe of of it was really nice, and I think I f I fit the the environment <laughs> somehow. How many times did you get hit on? Fuck, <laughs> <laughs> every because everyone are like keep in mind everyone in Stonewall, all the bartenders, everyone was huge. Yeah. Like when I say huge, jacked. Oh, like, they're all muscle, yeah, muscular and big. Yeah, muscular and big, like proper, like like really good looking people. And I'm fucking tiny. I'm like, I'm 65 kilos <laughs> and 5'6", five, 5'7". Six, five, so, and on Thursdays, you had to work just wearing like pink shorts. No shirt, nothing. That's it? Yeah, that's it. Just okay. pink shorts. <laughs> and like, I think because I was so different from everyone, they would love me. Oh, you look like a teenager. I love it. <laughs> like, <laughs> fucking... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So like the the tips were amazing. I yeah. can't like the tips were amazing. It was definitely one of like because at the time when I got in Sydney, like that was was overpopulated. Yeah. So like every job was paying like twenty dollars an hour, yeah. doesn't matter what you were doing. 
that job was paying me thirty two dollars an hour, and after ten hours shift, you get like forty six. Yeah. So I was like, that's the best job I can and then have. Getting tips as well. I'm having fun. I get a free drink every <laughs> night. If I don't drink it, it accumulates. So I can have like, if I want to come here to party, I can get drunk really quick. <laughs> that's so a was, dangerous move, Gabe. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> and I was saving at the time, so I was like, I'm not drinking this. Like, I, when I go out, I need to drink for free because I had no money, honestly. My first week, after the first week uh, that I got my work car and my RSA, I had 400 bucks in my bank account. Mm. And it was one day that I had like 70 cents. Oh, wow. So it was like, ooh, <laughs> I can't even go back to Brazil with that. Yeah, that's right. So I was working, like I was doing removalist, doing that. I was studying English as well because I had to do six months of English here in Australia. So I was doing that and then COVID hit. Mm. And then at the time, I was also working a container. And was the only thing that didn't close because, you know, like here in Sydney, they closed everything. Yep. And then at the time I was working this container, I was paying, I was doing like 40 hours a week and I was getting 600 bucks. Wow. Oh yeah. So it was like. Hard work. Yeah. The guy was stealing from me. I found out later that actually he was getting paid a lot of money and then. Just paying you peanuts. Yeah. He would get like people that like was desperate for like work, work and then he would just pay nothing. So what are you, uh, just unloading containers or something? Yeah. yeah, and like most things were like, wasn't that bad in the beginning, but then once they found out I could do like uh, coffee bags, because I used to work with these big Maori dudes, like six foot something, a hundred and something kilos. So like lifting coffee bags for them is easy because it's 60 kilos. Mm. But then they found out like I could do as well because like I'm small, but I'm, I'm pretty strong. strong. Yeah. So I was doing the, the coffee bags with them as well. And sometimes we would do like three containers of coffee bags. And in two years, like halfway, you do by yourself. So you just take the coffee bags by yourself, 60 kilos. And I'm 65. So it was yeah. like, was was hard work. Yeah, it was pretty bad. And yeah. I, 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 my back got really bad after a few months and I had to stop doing that. And I started working with restaurants again. And then I've been working with restaurants since then, which yeah. is, I did a little bit of everything in restaurants from barista to bartender to a restaurant manager. So I did a little bit of everything, mm. which is, is good. Uh, like I got quite a bit of experience. Yeah. You know, try to with different type of jobs, at least for like foreigners and stuff. So then um, during the, the lockdown period for you, uh, so you were still, at least still busy, right? Like still yeah, working. I was working full yeah. time and I, I, I pick up surfing at the time. So I was like, I want to learn how to surf because I'm not from like a beach side in Brazil. So yeah. I was like, I need to, I want to learn how to surf. And I had a few friends that knew how to surf. I was like, I'm going to pick up this new hobby because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> And was pretty much the only thing they were allowed to do. Like you couldn't even go outside anymore. Pretty yeah. much, like <laughs> <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> so I was like surfing a lot. Um, I would do a little bit of jujitsu here and there, like in like literally like in the living room without like mats or anything with yeah. my friends. It's pretty much that. So then, how did you find grappling education? Uh because I I did training everywhere here in Australia. Yeah. Like my first month in Australia, I went to probably like thirty gyms. Yeah, and I tried to find somewhere that I like it. I ended up staying at Legacy for a bit. But then lockdown hit and then I moved away and I was, and I decided to, um, once the lockdown finished, I went to Origin in mm. Bondi. Mm. And then because of my ex, I ended up moving to the Shire and like in Karimba. Mm. And then it was too far for me. I didn't have a second car. I didn't have a car at the time. So I couldn't go to like Bondi every day to train. I ended up going to Gracie Miranda for a bit. Mm -hmm. But like the training was good, but like, most people were like hobbyists and like a little bit older as well. So they weren't really into like jujitsu and they were more for like the fitness sides of it. And I was always like training hard and blah, blah, blah. So I had to pace myself a lot over there. Yeah. And then I decided to, as soon as I bought a second car, I was talking to Mario, one of the guys from the gym that actually was training with me at the time. And I was like, you know, I, I really need to like get back into training really hard. Because in Brazil, my gym was like really hard. Mm. And I was like, where, where did you train? Um, it's a small, it's a small gym. It's Equipia, the name. It's actually in the translation is Team A. Team A. Yeah. So instead of like B team, it's like A, a team. team. <laughs> yeah. That's literally the name. And they have now, they have like 42 gyms now. Like yeah. my coach. Yeah. He has a lot of okay. gyms now in Brazil. It's a big association. Yeah. 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 Like huge. And the headquarters is the only competition. So it was, I, and I started the headquarters. So it was like, I learned from. Guys who are competitive. Yeah. So like I, when I came to Australia, it was a big, like, oh, gosh, a lot of hobbies. But I didn't realize because it was my gym was like that. A At the time, gym. I didn't realize, oh, I thought just jiu-jitsu here wasn't that good until I started coming to gyms like Grapple Education, Sydney, and blah, blah, blah. Mm. Were you doing, so out of curiosity, when it came to, tra so training in Brazil, did they do a lot more gi still? Oh, yeah. So and was even everything nowadays, was gi. Yep. Yeah, even nowadays, still, like, gi-based. Very similar. Actually, Sydney is very similar to that as well. You Most gyms have, like, two classes a week, three classes a week, no gi. My gym in Brazil is the same, 
but the funny thing is my my coach in Brazil he's a uh, Brazilian national champion in nogi mm. so and he only had like two classes a week yeah wow yeah so like was really hard training but mainly gi so i did gi for basically like my first three four years in jiu-jitsu yep and then i started doing no gi only when i came to the grappling indication oh really yeah okay like it's been less than a year that i'm doing just no, no gi, gi focus yeah actually less than six months because i was still doing like gi a lot yeah and then but then because i got a second car i was like oh now i can commit to go somewhere else and like grappling indication wasn't too far from karen but i was like i'm gonna go there see how it is and then at the time raf the gi coach was just starting i was like Oh, I need to learn from someone like from Andrea Galvão. Mm. And I I ended up doing the Nogi class with Jeremy and I was like, you know what? I think I don't like the gi anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it has that effect, doesn't it? Gosh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's so much easier to fight with someone bigger than you because there's yeah. no grips. Yeah, you can so scramble, right? Yeah, I felt like, oh, that's perfect for me. I'm like, I'm tiny. I'm good at like moving around. Yeah. It's much better. It's much easier for me to do Nogi than the gi. Yeah, you I know? think it'll be one of those things it's only when you get... um when you get older and less athletic and it's like, okay, I need to slow things down. I want to get back in the gi. Well, that's get probably the time yeah. to get back in the gi, right? Yeah, get the grips and yeah. like you slow people down. I still, gosh, I wish I could say I still enjoy doing the gi, but then like I literally tried to put the gi two weeks ago and I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> like Rafa it's saw. too hot. It's yeah, Rafa saw my face. That's when I had to make a grip. My face went like, what, I'm doing that? And why, then, why am I doing this? I was like, yeah, it's not for me anymore. Like at least not at the moment. Like yeah. I'm, I'm trying to focus in the no gi game. No gi. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because, like, there's many, like, multiple different schools of thought on it. Like, there are guys that will be, like, you know, um, if you focus on gi training, a lot of it will translate over uh, to no gi. There are people that are like, no, you should, if you want to focus on no gi, just do no gi only. Um, because, oh, yeah, at the end of the day, you can't use the grips, right? There's yep. no grips when, when you go to no gi. So if you have a, a, gi, a grip dominant game, then, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't translate, doesn't as well. translate at all. Yeah. You know, if you're a guy that plays spider guard, it's pretty hard to play spider guard and yeah. no gi. Yeah, anything so. with like call is leave is really hard to translate. And my game, in, that's why I felt like I, I was a bit out of place when I started doing Nogi. Because my game was De La Hiva and call is leave. Mm. So like as soon as you go to Nogi, De La Hiva works if you like very active. If you're a little bit lazy. I was a very lazy like De La Hiva player. Because like, at the gym I was training, I could be lazy. Mm. Until I came to grapple and the coach was like, oh, oh gosh, I can't be lazy anymore. Yeah, people are controlling I, this opposite leg. Yeah, yep. and so I'm now, I'm now I need to start switching my game. And I feel like it's the opposite. My game in no gi doesn't translate at all to the gi. <laughs> and then when I'm going to play gi, I'm like, gosh, I'm getting smashed. <laughs> and it's I'll, depressing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is because it feels like I'm like, I start getting something, but I'm losing somewhere else. Yeah. Which is it's fine because I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. So at it, I guess, you know, if we go a little bit more down the jiu-jitsu rabbit hole, uh, in terms of like training styles, so uh, I'm a bit curious about like what the training was like in Brazil um, at the A team, and then obviously like if you were to compare that to say being at grappling education, like the, f the focus in terms of like um, class structure, how they teach, oh. you know, what are the differences? And being honest, like grappling education is the place the most similar that I had with my gym in Brazil, like similar vibe. Um, besides the coach being. A really nice guy. <laughs> like so yeah. the coach at the A team wasn't nice? <laughs> nah, he was like, he was like, he wasn't a nice guy. Like, he were, were they very big on, because that's, you know, I guess um, the whole, whole Creonch thing, right? Like some, some. Oh, no, no. That's something that I learned in Australia, the Creonch stuff. Yeah. Because the thing is like my gym in Brazil, because we have so many gyms and my coach was always like, he's really like well known in Brazil, like south of Brazil at least. So I would have days that I would go to the gym and then he would be like, dude, we're going to this gym. Do you want to come with us? And I'm like, yeah, definitely. And we would do like that once a month, at least once a month. There was a month that I trained more in other gyms with my coach than at our gym. Wow. Because he would literally like, oh, I know this guy. Like, we're going to his gym and do like a kind of like a dojo storm thing. Kind of thing. <laughs> but it was like. Without the challenge. It wasn't a challenge. Yeah, we fought the challenge. Yeah. But like he would bring like. Five guys and. Yeah, usually he would bring, like, his best this students guy, and yeah. me. <laughs> 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 and then we would, like, go and train, like, everywhere. And, like, when I came to Sydney, I started seeing, like, gyms. I don't want to say names. Can I say names? Yeah, you can say names. Oh, yeah, the fucking Legacy and Gracie, they're, like, you can't go anywhere else. Yeah. And I felt like, that was, I don't know Legacy at the, at the time. Now I don't know because we have people from that train everywhere. Yeah. And yeah. people from Legacy that come here. But Gracie is very much like that. Very, like, um, if you train with us, you train with us. No one else. Yeah. And he might be able to go to another Gracie mm. and stuff like that. And I felt like my coaches here in Australia, they were all like, oh, we're not really into like cross training and stuff. And all I could think about was like, why not? Yeah. Like, I, I, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. 
and you might not even have the same game that I have. So why would I want to learn from you everything? Like yeah. I read and learn from someone that has a similar body type, a similar game. And blah, blah, blah. And Origin was really good with it. Uh, to be honest, in Bondi, they were like, dude, go and train there. I think we actually my coach, Leo, at the time, he was like, dude, I think you should go and do a class with the, uh, Levi at the time because yeah. I think he would be really good for your game because I was really like into De bolos and De La Hiva. Yep. And I, I felt like, oh, that's really good. And then when I moved to other gyms, they were like, oh, no, no. And actually it was a, it was kind of like a bit of a bitter time and I left my older gym because I came to Grapple Indication because they felt like I was betraying them. But when I moved to my last gym, I was training two places and wasn't a problem at the time. So I couldn't understand why it was a problem now for me to train two places. Mm. And then when I came to Grapple Indication, I saw Kel telling people like, dude, go to Sydney West to do this or go to Sydney Wrestling to do this. And I was mm. like, oh gosh. They actually like the cross training, here, yeah. Which is important. Like you, you need to do cross training. I yeah. feel like you can't learn everything from one person. Yeah, I well, feel it's it's one of those things, right? Like if you're not, um, and if you're a competitor, right? You either got to compete so regularly that you already know, sort of like you've had experience c- competing against people from all the other gyms. Because that's the only yeah. other way that you're going to cross train technically, exactly. um, without you know being at a place that's open doors in the sense that you know you t- you can go wherever and train wherever. Yeah. But like I think that's you know apart from competition, that's the next best thing to competition because you're getting to train with people that you don't not regularly roll with that you may not know from a bar of soap and you've got to work out, you know, it's, yeah. you've got to problem solve, you know, what is their game, what's your game uh, to address this and, and do it in a way where it's, you know, you're not trying to be a dick about it, right? Like, Yeah, yeah. it's like you don't have like the, the anxiety of going to a comp or like having to win because yeah. you're going to another gym and now you're just trying to like have fun and... <laughs> see someone new like because it can get pretty boring especially if you're in a small gym like it's not the case with grapple education i feel like there's a lot of people that i never rolled with because mm. like we have a lot of students Same people yeah yeah and sometimes like i i pick i try to pick now more often my partners that i'm training with because i'm working on stuff and i feel like i can't just roll with big people all the time so <laughs> i try to choose like the people that i i know i can have a really hard round and still gonna learn from it yeah because i haven't like developed the game to beat them yet yeah but then also, I still enjoy like going to other gyms, but now more often I feel like I don't need to, especially mm. because we have so many coaches and grapple indication. Like, it and people are coming to to the exactly. classes to cross train, yeah, all the time. So, all the time. so it's I just feel one like of those things. And yeah. I don't like paying the the dropping fees. Like, <laughs> I feel like I I do every time. Don't get me wrong, I do pay the dropping fees you're every good, time. I actually man, I ask them to pay. I'm like sometimes they're like, no, don't worry about it. I'm like, no, 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 dude, I want to support the gym. I'm here using this space. But then sometimes they are asking for like 40 bucks uh, a in. class. I'm yeah. like, dude, I'm, I'm not here to learn. just here to roll a little bit and like have fun with you. <laughs> like we both can learn from this experience, <laughs> yeah. but 40 bucks. <laughs> You're a good man. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm like in this, yeah, like I'll, I'll drop in that, you know, I'll, uh, like <laughs> if, if you if you want me to pay, I will, but you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I travel for work, so it's I like just feel like sometimes I, go I get to, to go plenty of places to train, you know. Yeah, you can't be paying everywhere you yeah. go as well. And oh, like, oh, I think it also depends. Like, there's, there's, I guess you know, there's a little bit of a value exchange too, right? Like, a lot of the times, if I'm traveling, I'm traveling to do a podcast. So it's like, okay, you know, if you guys have got a session on, like, let's roll beforehand because I always like, I, li- I like rolling with my guests. I like, sp- I like training with people that I've, you know, that I that come on the podcast as well because yeah. it's like it's good to sort of, um, and this sounds really, really weird, but like I think, you know, when you're when you're like training with somebody or you're sparring or whatever, you're rolling whatever, you you learn a bit about that person. Oh, that, definitely. That, you know, that it's, 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 not, it's unspoken, right? Yeah, you get that persona of the person. Like, yeah. you have an idea of, like, if it's... Who they are. Yeah. Right? Because you only see, like, how, like, someone... If someone is a dick, you're going to see during a role. Yeah. Like, if he's like that during a role and you know he's similar to that. Not not every time. Yeah. Like, especially with competitors. Yeah. But if you're just, like, a, like trying to do, like, a light role or something like that and you see the person is getting frustrated or getting angry about it, you can tell, like, oh, this person... Might be not a nice person outside of the gym as well. Yeah, or they or they've, or they've been in a bad mood today, right? Yeah, like yeah. you you sort of pick up on these little nuances in terms of like how they function in that capacity that you go, oh, okay, I see what kind of a person you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. Like, yeah, you can tell like how someone is by like rolling with not completely, but you have an understanding of like yeah. what kind of person this person is. Yeah, which is yeah. But that's why I ended up coming to grappling education. Was like I need hard training, and then the first day I was like I got bashed <laughs> and then i felt like the first class i had in brazil yeah so then i was like you know what i don't care i'm, I'm moving here yeah and because i moved here my other friend mario that we were talking in like about it like coming to the grapple education for a bit he had decided to quit the gym as well that we were training together and came with me mm. and then like a week after and 
yeah, it was pretty much that. And it was it was good to have someone that I knew, but like I'm, I made friends really quick here. Like everyone's so nice. Everyone's like, some of them look very in the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> you, you should name names here. <laughs> Who are we talking about Fucking specifically? Jude, Jude is definitely on the spectrum. <laughs> Kel is definitely on the spectrum somehow. <laughs> but there's no way that human is a, a normal person. Like not an normal person, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. he's very like in the spectrum, especially with ADHD. Yeah. And like I felt like very like welcome because sometimes I definitely feel like I'm in the spectrum somehow, like yeah. in little things. And then I was like, oh, this place feels like <laughs> definitely like if, if I'm gonna say like there is a place that feels like home for me is 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 here. <laughs> I mean, uh, we were literally in my house. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> yeah, we we graduated from the uh, grappling education casting couch to the grappling education bang bus. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely, like we are in my home. So like it feels like home. Yeah. Feels like and like. The things that I felt like I missed in Brazil, like in my gym in Brazil, because my gym in Brazil, the only reason was I was still there was the hard training. Mm. But the people over there were really like dodgy people. Like they they were very like not not nice human beings in general. Like, Is there a lot of gangs there? Oh, in Brazil, yeah, quite a yeah. bit. Yeah, and then but the funny thing about my gym, we had like cops, and we had also like drug dealers training yeah. in the gym. Yeah, and like it was just like a, a lot of. Um, bad blood in my gym with a lot of people and everyone would be talking shit about everyone behind their backs that's why i never really enjoy my coach was very much like that as well he doesn't speak english so i don't care yeah but like it was was pretty much like that like did it ever like erupt into anything like oh all the time all the time and especially with like chicks training in the gym was yeah. like it was very like so what would happen yeah like, it was just like they would talk like shit about everyone in the behind their backs and then they would like make like really like uh, unappropriate jokes about like women and stuff in general at the gym and in front of people in the gym and i was like this place doesn't feel like like me i'm very yeah. like i'm very well, i'm a very peaceful person in general and i don't like that much of like that drama i love the drama when it's like something small and like just like a gossip yeah but like at the gym in brazil was like, it was a lot it's serious drama <laughs> Yeah, a lot, a lot of like drama like that, and people talking about like why, like other people's wives and other people's husband. And I was like, Dude, like we here to do jujitsu. Yeah, and like the training was amazing. That's why I was still there. And then when I came to grappling education, I was like, gosh, this is amazing. The training is amazing. The coaches are amazing. Yep. everyone is really friendly. The only thing we're missing is a bar in the gym. <laughs> because we had a bar in my old gym in Brazil. Really? Yeah, like because in Brazil you're allowed to do stuff like that. So we had like a proper bar with like a selling like stuff to eat and stuff to do oh, okay. and at the end of the day most of the guys would just stay hang out for like an hour or two and just drink beers and stuff yeah, at the time i wasn't drinking at all i stopped drinking for like two three years in brazil i was doing like a vegetarian like diet as well so Whoa, it was okay. yeah you, was gotta you gotta tell me about this so what, what what uh what was the reason why you suddenly went on this vegetarian? oh just pure training like i felt like if i was vegetarian i was lighter and it was easier for me to train and it definitely for me at least was yeah but then when I came to Australia, I kind of like fall off the track. The first six months I was doing pretty well. And then after that, I was like, oh, it's, I'm eating shit all the time now. But do you reckon it's just a, a mental thing? Because I think, you know, like if you were to do blood work and just if you were purely a vegetarian and you weren't supplementing, like I think, you know, you, yeah. you, you're you probably not in as good physical condition as what probably you think. Not. Right? Probably not. It was more like a mental and like feeling light at the time, like when I was training. But I was hungry all the time. Yeah. Which would affect my mood a lot. Be angry like all I, the I time. get, yeah, I get hangry, yeah, like all the time, and then I would be like, "Gosh!" And I would train really hard, and then it wouldn't. I think because I did for a short period, it wasn't too bad. But I think if I was going to do the same way I was doing for like a year or two, I would probably just like have um, anemia or something like that. Yeah, just like my blood wouldn't like keep up with it, my body wouldn't keep up with it. Yeah, because that's you need that, to supplement. Yeah, like I think I think part of you know uh, when people talk about vegan superpowers, right? Like if you're a vegan and you and you feel like you're this, you know, holy kind of being yeah you know your body's not a, a graveyard of chicken bones so to speak yeah <laughs> right like i think that's it's really just a mental thing you're not yeah. you're not actually don't really have any superpowers from no, eating no. in that particular, just like particular you fashion you, you, like, you just feel better about yourself I, yeah you I feel like say. you're better than other people <laughs> yeah, yeah like it, it's like it's a cock thing like you go like oh you you're kidding but like i have different views about that and nowadays and like i did the vegetarian i tried to do the vegan for a week and i was like dude i can't do vegan it's impossible. I don't know how people do it. Honestly, everything has like product. product Some kind of animal animal. product. Yeah, yeah, so it's like it's pretty much impossible. And if you're really going to do like properly, you have to stop wearing like types of cosmetic stuff and 
clothes, everything, everything. Yeah, yeah, a lot of it, a lot of things. But then you also don't consider the insects that you're yeah. killing. So I guess like you choose. Yeah, which you're choosing one you what you're you like. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a bit weird, but not my place to say. You know, uh, I'll, I'll bring this up, and you know, if you, if anyone loves Tim Tams out there, uh, if you actually actually look at the ingredients of Tim Tams, like it's it's got um crickets and cockroaches in it. Yeah. Um, I think it's Aneto or something like that. And um, there's a cochineal in there. If you actually Google what they are, you realise that, yeah, for... And I don't even, it doesn't even make sense why you'd put that in Tim Tams, but... Yeah, I don't know how they, like, how they find out, like, oh, let's put this in here yeah. and see how it tastes. Right. <laughs> you know like what I mean? Like <laughs> so I don't eat Tim Tams anymore. Yeah. I, I, like, I don't like Tim Tams. Yeah. <laughs> I, I try them and then they're too sweet for me. I'm not a big fan of sweets and I tried Tim Tams the first time and everyone like the Brazilians that were with me, oh gosh, that's so good. And I'm going like, dude, I can't eat, like I can't have another bite of it. Is I going to, I'm going to die from diabe- diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about acai? Are you in the, are Oh, you? I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of acai. <laughs> like, I can't have, like if, if it wasn't because of the price here in Australia, in Brazil it's really expensive as well. Is it? Yeah. It's, like, Cause it's, it's a huge thing in Brazil as well. Mm. So like they sell like for quite a bit of money. But if it wasn't like twenty bucks for one big acai, I would have every day, mm. like every day, yeah, <laughs> for breakfast and dinner, yeah, and then eat more after. <laughs> <laughs> now I gotta ask about the the tattoo on your neck. It says "Time in a Tree." Oh, it, it's it's a British guy that is Relic Ritchie. Uh, he's like a um, a singer and actor. In, he was actually in Game of Thrones. Okay. Yeah, and what what character? Uh you know Daenerys. Yeah, she has a general that they cut that. Cocks off. Yeah, Grey Worm. Yeah, I think he's the eunuch guy. Yeah, yeah, the eunuch guy, the darker skin guy. Yeah, yeah. the dark skin yeah, guy. Yeah. So he is him, and uh, like this song is about anxiety, and he talks about like um, back in time when he was young and used to climb trees and feel like like he's he's before getting anxious and remember like how life was easy was when he was climbing trees and playing around, and it relates a lot with me because I I definitely I. I was talking to my therapist about this before and I was like, I, I know it's like the moment that I figured out what anxiety was. Mm. And like, I, I have in my mind exactly the time when flicking in my head, this is anxiety. I didn't know the name at the time, but I, the feeling, the first time I had the feeling, I used to love climbing trees. Mm. One day I found out, my mom told me actually, there's a lot of spiders in trees and I have like, that fear of spiders <laughs> and that day i was like i'm never climbing a tree again okay. and then i listened to the song and i was like gosh that relates so much with me it's talking about anxiety and like before i had anxiety it's a very similar experience mm. and I, I thought it was so weird because it's fucking like from london and i'm from brazil and we have a very similar experience and i don't even know where he found trees to climb in london because i see london as like just a rock place <laughs> but i never been there so i don't i don't yeah. know it's my vision of london okay so it's just from that song. That's what. Makes yeah, and like I'm gonna get this tra- tattoo. <laughs> yeah, I was like, all my tattoos were kind of like that. Like I would like have a, like, oh, I saw that, and I'm, oh, I'm gonna get it. Yeah. But this one had like at least like a background for it. I was like, I need to get it. I felt like fe- it feels like it needs to be there. Yeah. The same thing with the one in my neck. The true friend stabbing you in the front was very similar. Mm. At the time, I just got it because I liked the song, and now I feel like, oh gosh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All that happened. Yeah. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got to get into that. Yeah. Into that, right? So, um, right yeah, when we, I finished the beers, yeah, right when we finished <laughs> the beers, right? Like we're gonna talk about this story. So, you, you started telling me this crazy story about. Um, you don't have to mention any names, and, and if you're yeah. not comfortable to talk about, oh, it, I'm, I'm fine. To I told everyone. Uh, like I, I didn't tell anyone for so many years that I felt like I had to tell everyone that I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I was hiding for so long. Yeah. Well. Okay. So so tell the story, and I, I, I do want to circle back to the therapist thing, but um, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, let's let's go. Through She's the involved story. with this as well. Yeah. 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 So, but uh, like my first like eleven months here in Australia was already like a bit over Australia because I wasn't training much and I was having like I had really shit jobs with the container stuff and restaurants and I wasn't really happy here and I was thinking about moving to Byron Bay until my visa runs out and move somewhere else. Yeah. And then at the time I ended up meeting this girl that lives like not far from here and I was living in my Rubra at the time. And then we started like seeing each other and she was in a really dark place at the time for with like uh, personal life and stuff. And I felt like related to it and like we had a very like trauma bonding experience of like <laughs> both are like in a really bad place and i, f- I have this I-, I know i have this uh like saver complex that yeah. i feel like i can fix someone yeah and at the time i didn't think about that but at the time i was like she's in a really bad place she can be like someone amazing 
she she's a nice person don't get me wrong she's very relatable like she has an amazing smile so every time people come and talk to her all the time like people mm. on the street and i feel like i'm very different from that because when i'm walking on the street i'm like i look like i'm gonna stab someone sometimes <laughs> and like she's very relatable so i felt like very relatable to her as well it was easy to talk she had a nice job at the time and i was very interested in her job because the way she spoke about it and blah 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 and was very, everything was very quick Mm. I was looking for a place to move out, uh, to move in uh, around Cronulla because I was looking for jobs in Cronulla. And she had a roommate because uh, it was a two-bedroom apartment. And she was like, I'm going to kick out my roommate. He's like, I can't live with him anymore. He's like, he doesn't clean anything. The house smells like shit because he leaves stuff everywhere. And I was like, you know what? I'm looking for a place to move. And then she was like, yeah, but like, we just start seeing each other. And I was like, yeah, but we're going to be like roommates. We... We're not like living together. It's not like we're dating and living together. I'm mm. moving to the other room and whatever happens after that happens. Mm. But we were already like dating properly, dating and seeing each other pretty much every day. So the first two weeks I would go to her house every day and spend a lot of hours with her and then just leave to work and go back to hers. So I was pretty much already living with her and I was like, all right, let's kick him out and I'll move in and I'll move in in like a three weeks, a month maybe. Oh no, it was actually probably like end of the year. I met her end of october i move in december so probably like two months and then i move in and then we started dating and then things were like already like be bad and i kept explaining to myself was like oh no it's like the culture difference is the language barrier uh she's going through a dark time right now because she was getting divorced and, um a really close friend of her um passed away in like in america and i was like oh gosh that's a lot and i was like just making an excuse for myself for her mm. in that case i was like it, once this past is gonna get better and once this and blah blah, blah. and it was a lot of up and downs and then she told me a bit a bit about like her um, mental health and like her psychiatrist and she didn't really believe in everything they told her and then we just kept going and i kept just always making excuse like it's gonna get better i'm not saying i was an amazing partner like far from it like because it got to the point i was like i can't i can't relate with you anymore i can't open to you because i feel like Every time we try to talk about something, it's something depressing. It's something sad. There's no, there's no happenings in your life. And it ends up becoming like, if I talk about it, I'm also not something good in your life because we're talking about only depressing stuff all the time, mm. every day for three years. So yeah. it was like, it's very depressing. And then I would see like her with like friends and stuff and just this persona would come out and be like, Happy. I feel amazing. And then you see posts on Instagram, we're having the best time, we're doing stuff together and, People couldn't even see like that, like all the trips, everything that we had a little bit of fun and took photos. There was a fight right before or right after and like a really bad fight about like arguments and stuff like that. And I got to the point that I got like really rough and I was ready to leave and like break up and got again to that kind of like thing of like, ah, oh, no, I don't know what I'm going to do without you and blah, blah, blah. And then I would like just, ah, oh, it's going to get better after this. And then we end up deciding to to do the visa situation together because I, I was I was trying to do through work, and it was it's it's really complicated the visa situation here in Australia, especially if you're not like an engineer or a doctor, mm. like they make life very hard for you to like get a visa, like a resident visa. And I that's what I wanted. I didn't want to do student visas anymore. And then I was going to try to do through work, and then she offered to do the partner visa with me. And then I I I thought it quite a bit for about it. And I decided to hire like a lawyer and talk to them about it. Like what would be my best option? And they, they told me, look, honestly, you don't have the skills uh, of the proper like graduation and stuff to get like a working visa and become a, a permanent resident later. And if you're already in a relationship and you guys been dating for two years at the time was like, is your best option? Mm. But there was a complication of her applying a visa with someone else before, cause she's Australian and she applied with um, a French woman before cause she was married. And she was trying to get divorced during the time that we met each other. And then we finally, she finally right. got the divorce. She was married to a French woman. Yeah. Yeah. So she, at the time she was bi, I, I believe now she considered herself a lesbian. I, I, I don't really know. Like it, <laughs> it's not my place to say like yeah. what she considered herself. Um, but at the time she was like, when I met her, she was still married and okay. she was trying to get a divorce. But I, now I find out how hard it is to get a divorce in Australia because I'm trying to get one. <laughs> And I can't even apply for it until next year, which is pretty shit. But anyways, um, so then we, I spoke to the lawyers. Uh, she was already divorced. And then she was finally taking like a medication for like, oh, 
her mental health problems and was things were getting really good actually for three months was amazing like from the end of like 2022 to beginning of 2023 was was pretty good we were having like a really good time mm. and then we decided to get married i spoke to the lawyers because the lawyers were like oh it's better if you do like a proper like get married get married like paperwork and everything better than a de facto relationship because there is always like the the concern of like she got married with a french woman now mm. she's getting married with a guy if you don't get married seems suspicious seems like you're selling visas yeah that's what pretty much what my lawyers told me and i was like okay um let's do it things are good now i finally decided to let my mom come to brazil to australia because i was always pushing i was like things gonna like oh, i'm moving houses i'm moving jobs i want to be able to get i was just making excuses because i knew like what my mom was going to end up seeing like my relationship with this person and then when she finally like things got better we decided to get married and do the paperwork my mom bought the flights and i did the visa for her but i fucked up my mom's visa i don't know what happened like her visa was the wrong dates of birth oh so i no. had to cancel her flights luckily she got like a full refund flight and then i had to cancel her visa but like we already had booked the f the, the wedding everything and then my mom was coming the week of the wedding so I had two days to redo a visa for my mom. It was like pretty quick. The first one took like 20 days. The second one took 12 hours. Yeah, wow. And then she got the visa straight away. We got f new flights for her. And then my ex and I, we had a really bad fight, like really bad. And I was like, now I don't know what to do. Like we're getting married in like three days. My mom is already literally like was getting in the flight <laughs> to come to Australia. And I was like, gosh, what do I do? And then I spoke to a friend of mine. And I was like, really close my pretty much at the time was my only like close friend and she was brazilian and i told her everything that happened which was a lot and she was like i don't even know what to say and i was like yeah i don't know what to do and she was like but you're getting married and the visa and now it's too late for everything and i was like oh gosh yeah the visa because at the time i was like i love this person i want to be with this person i was seeing myself with this person for a long time mm. even with the up and downs and then after that i was like gosh I fucked up. I was literally like, I, I, I completely fucked up. Yeah. Because I'm going to get married. My mom is in a flight. How are I going to tell my mom, like, when she gets here, that I'm not getting married? She's coming for it. And I was like, okay, let's do it. And then things got, like, even worse after that. And then the first two weeks when my mom was here was fine. And then the last week, just things just went nuts. And, like, very, very bad. And my mom saw everything. My mom, actually, my mom helped me to pack every, everything in my house <laughs> to leave the house and I was going to stay with this friend for a few days until my mom leave and then I decided what I was doing with my life and then my mom left went back to Brazil we, I tried to make make pieces while my mom was here so my mom wouldn't like be worried about me but I know she, I knew she was going to be like super worried once she leave and then a week after like there was another like really bad fight and I had we like she called an ambulance because she was feeling very suicidal but because she said I was in the house, end up becoming cops to the house because like domestic violence they thought, and then, like we explained the situation, what was going on, and then the cops were like, "Oh, okay, so it, it's really like she's very depressed and blah blah blah." We went to the hospital, and then after that, that was probably like June. After mm -hmm. that, things were like very weird between us. I was like, I was very avoidant. I didn't want to spend too much time with her. I didn't want to talk about anything. So it was a very boring relationship at the time, and we just got married. <laughs> And then I invited a friend of mine to move to the house because she was leaving the uh, Sydney and she needed a place to crash for a few weeks. I was like, yeah, just come stay with me. We have a two-bedroom apartment, two uh, bathrooms. It's, it's fine. Like, it, things are fine between us. It, you'd be fine. And, like, two weeks were fine. Her brother actually came to see her and stay for a bit in Australia. I, we went to pick him up in the airport. He came to the house. And two days after that, uh my ex and I, we had, like, a really bad fight. And I left the house. I was like, I can't stay around you. Yeah. Once my friend leaves the uh, the house, I come back, and then we discuss what we're doing for our lives. Because, yeah. like, it's too yeah, difficult. Yeah. And I was pretty sure, like, we we done. And she was also the same. She was like, I'm done. I don't want to do this. And then when I came back to the house, like, once my friend left, I saw her a day before she left. And she actually said goodbye to me. She came to the restaurant and said goodbye on the day she was leaving. I was like, yeah, I'm going to miss you a lot. Because was pretty much the only person that knew about the whole situation yeah the whole situation everything that was going on not even my therapist because i was lying to everyone i was like i don't want this to come out and like eventually be bad for my visa or something like that because at the time i was like now i i, I need to get this visa because i was like I'm, i completely fucked up and 
I still had like a, a friendship with her. We spoke about it and she was trying to convince me to do the visa still with her. And I was like, yeah, but that's not safe for me because I'm going to spend all my money because the visa would end up being like with lawyers and everything would end up being 16 to 21 grand and could be even more than that. And I told her like, look, I, I don't trust you uh, to do a visa because you can withdraw the application any minute. I lose all my money and I need, still need to leave the country in like 20 days. Mm. And then she was like trying to convince me that now it was going to happen. And then probably like two days after that we spoke about, I came back to the house. We were trying to be friends and pretend that we were still like nice to each other. And then she decided to tell me she fell in love with my friend. That was a girl that was leaving the house. <laughs> and then I was like, what the fuck? And she's like, yeah, sorry. We spent a lot of time together. And I was like, yeah, good luck with that. There's no way she's going to end up like having anything with you because i was like she's my best friend she knows everything you did to me she knows everything you did to my mom like there's no way that something's gonna happen and then a few days after i saw like she was showing me something on her phone and i just saw a message of my friend coming through and i'm like it's been four days since she replied me like i thought she was like having a bad time in barn bay trying to like get a new job and like settle down and then I asked, like, my ex, like, what's, what's going on? Like, why my friend is texting you and she hasn't replied? And she was like, yeah, she is actually in love with me. <laughs> it's like the feeling is mutual. And I'm like, what? <laughs> she was leaving my house. I, I, I slept in my car for five days, all right? Like, because, like, once I left the house, I didn't want to stay with anyone. Yeah. Like, a lot of people offer me places to stay. I was like, no, I want to be by myself. And I stayed in my car. And my car is, like, that little tiny thing over there. <laughs> like... And then she told me, like, she was in love with my friend and my friend was in love with her. And then she booked flights to go to Byron Bay to see her. And I was like, what is going on? What's going on? Like, yeah, we've been together for three years and then you offered to do the visa with me. I didn't want to do a freaking visa with anyone because I knew, like, I would be, like, stuck with someone and they could use that against me. You were literally trying to offer me to do a visa until yesterday. And now you're telling me, like, you're going to Byron Bay after a week that we probably broke up and she was like yeah but like you don't see my side and i'm like yeah i i do see your side like you insane like that makes no sense in anyone's head <laughs> like and then like we, we had to stay for a little bit together and like living together because like the two the two bedroom situation blah, blah. and at the whole time i was still thinking about like oh, i don't want to just leave the house and leave her paying the apartment by herself and leave her figure out her life by herself and then I was just like, that, that's so fucking stupid. Then I spoke to Cal and Cal was like, dude, go live in the van. We just need to do a few things. When he said a few things, I was like, oh, we just need to put a bed in. I was like, it was a lot of work to, <laughs> to <laughs> move yeah, in. Right. <laughs> so yeah, that was pretty much the whole situation. That's why I can't stay in Australia right now because I'm still in a student visa. And because I'm married to an Australian, like legally married, I can't, I can't do other visas. Yeah. everything looks suspicious why are you doing a student visa you married to an australian i don't have the skills to do a sponsorship through work because of like my i don't have a bachelor or something like that yeah. i only have diplomas and stuff like that don't really count as for like visas so then i'm like yeah i can't really do much about okay, it oh what a mess yeah yeah and then i haven't spoke to my friend since everything happened and i my, my friend yeah and my That's ex a pretty tough yeah position to be in right like yeah you know, <laughs> like, I still, like, I say it, and I'm like, that sounds, like, made up. Like, it's too much. Yeah. You know, like, it doesn't sound like... Like reality, right? Like, sounds yeah, like, like a TV show. That's what How does it go like. from, like, three years dating to, like, I fell in love with someone that was living in the house for three weeks? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it's a lot. Yeah. And I was like, okay, it is what it is. I feel like I disassociate for a bit as well. Like, I didn't know exactly how to handle it. So, I was just, like, trying to do the best I could. Like, just train a lot, work. I still like and I finally felt like I was getting out of it and then this week again like I found out like the Brazilian girl yeah she was Your also friend. Brazilian yeah, yeah, yeah my friend yeah. she she's back living like in the area yeah. I was like god damn yeah. like go anywhere else like you <laughs> don't really need to be here but I'm like yeah it is what it is I'm leaving anyways I only yeah. have a few more months so yeah it is yeah wow so then um fuck yeah i know it's a lot of information <laughs> and I, I like i'm trying to cut down like <laughs> uh how, how, how does th that relate to the therapist and i guess like how did you get involved with a therapist and so i i did therapy like here and there and like i did when i was younger 
uh, when I was in Brazil still. And then... Wait, so ha- what, what, why did you start going to therapy when you were in Brazil? Uh, at the time, I was feeling, like, anxious about things. And I was trying to figure it out. I've, like, I... I feel like in Brazil when I was doing therapy it was more as like a, a mentoring than like a proper like therapy session because the person I was doing was a psychologist but I I went to like a north like where do I point where do I go I I'd need someone to like give me ideas and like like say things out loud and see if I was sounding crazy about like wanting to leave the country and try a new life and then I stopped for a bit I did a few f- sessions here and there while I was in Australia but I couldn't find someone that I liked it and then the Brazilian girl that was working with me was my best friend. She was telling me about her therapist, which was like quite expensive because she does like high profiles in Brazil. Mm. And then she finally got like me a spot to do a therapy session with her. And this psychologist was amazing. But her therapist, like my best friend at the time, therapist is was the same as mine. And then the whole thing happened and I just couldn't talk to my therapist about it. Yeah, I was like you literally seeing her and like I know it's like I'm one client she's another client there's no relationship there but like you're still a human being yeah, you're, still you, gonna you're associating it in your own head like exactly like and I know up. I know like doesn't matter what I say or whatever she says you somehow you're still gonna pick a side in your head even though like my sound unprofessional but you are a human being you can't just be like neutral about everything it's impossible otherwise you wouldn't even be able to be a psychologist hmm. so I was like yeah I'd don't want to do it with you anymore and I, I stopped doing the therapy with her because I was like it's too close everything is, sounds too close to me and then I'm, I'm yeah that's pretty much it okay yeah. so then do you have a new one now or? I actually started next week again okay. with someone else yep. uh, from another friend of mine but like I like to do with like Brazilians because I feel like some things don't relate in Portuguese some things don't relate in English it's a bit of a weird thing that I have like with the English and Portuguese so oh, okay so when you when you do the sessions, then are you doing it in both Portuguese and English then so that you can sort of explain in both languages? I, I try to relate with some, like this one that I was doing, the last one, she was she didn't know how to speak English, so I couldn't do that. But the one that I'm starting again, she she lived outside of Brazil. She had she lived in London for a bit and then uh, she speaks, like she's fluent in English. So sometimes I feel like two different people, like, mm-hmm. you know, like there's the Portuguese gay bro that stayed in Brazil for a while <laughs> and there's the, because I don't have many Brazilian friends here. Like, mo- all my friends are Australians. So I have, like, probably one or two friends that I don't even talk that much that are from Brazil. Like, now I have a few more because, like, the last few months I was, like, I need to hang out with Brazilians for a bit. Yeah. But, like, most of my friends are Australian. So, everything I do is in English. I feel like kind of, like, sometimes it's two different people. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit weird. And it feels like I'm trying to communicate it still with, like, the Portuguese side of myself and the Portuguese side starting to talk to the English side in that case. Yeah. It'll be weird. Yeah, look, it's it's one of those things that, you know, you just have to, um, and I, I, I guess I'm only coming at this from the perspective that, you know, like I'm an Australian guy, but I'm also from an Asian background, right? Yeah. So. There's a the cultural difference. Yeah, well, there's, like there's cultural differences, right? And so I, I always like to view them as lenses. You know, there's different lenses that you view the world and perspectives, right? And so it's kind of nice having, being able to put on two different perspectives. Yeah. You know, because yeah. like the Eastern side of me is, would would probably um you know be a lot more when it comes to doing things it's like okay yeah just it's it's all about hard work and you know shut up and just do the work kind of a thing right and then you know the western side of me is like okay but you know are you getting rewarded the right way you know for this right like you know so you got to have that balance in terms of like you know when it comes to your occupation things like that yeah yeah. when, when do you speak up or when do you not you know and then versus you know um when you show people respect and like that, that kind of thing. So it's like, you know, I, I think the truth is like when you can look at things from many different perspectives, but then still see the same answer. Yeah. Because uh, even like with your story, right? Like, you know, we're, we're sharing um, your perspective on it. Obviously she would have a different perspective. Your friend would have a different perspective. And like, you know, when you sort of, if you were to view it from each of those different perspectives, you'd sort of work out, okay, well, that's what's happened. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a really tricky one, like, when it comes to perspectives and and especially when you have, like, those different cultures within you because, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, yes, you grew up in Brazil and you, so you, so you resonate with Brazilian culture and things like that, but you spent time here and you really enjoyed your time here. So it's like you're getting different influences. It's, it's almost like the cross-training thing. Yeah, exactly. Right? You don't, you don't know until you actually go and try somewhere else. and Because yeah, you, oh, okay. you only know one thing and then when you find out something new, you're like, oh, actually, yeah. I was wrong. Or... Yeah. 
I was right or yeah, it's different. It's just different. Right? There's no right or wrong in that case. Yeah. So yeah, that's why you know, like, um, like when Keller and I did the podcast, it was interesting because we'd come in at fr- we've come from two totally different martial arts backgrounds. Like I came from a very traditional background. He came through like a very sport oriented system of judo, but we both had come to the same conclusion that you know, um, at the end of the day, if you can, uh when you go out and you ex- explore and experience all this, all of these different things, you're going to work out what works, right? And so if anything, like if you're trying to limit your people from going in exp- and exploring and experiencing the world, um, all that happens in the long run is they end up leaving you anyway mm-hmm. because it's like when the moment that they feel like, oh, something else resonates slightly better, yeah. then they're going to go there. And so like I always uh, like talking about this idea about, you know, loyalty being a two-way street, you know, like – it was a big thing, especially in traditional schools, like they talk about loyalty, right? But like you got to think about, you know, what's the value exchange first of all? Because if you're paying for your fees and, you know, that you're getting taught something, well, that's a very different thing versus you're not paying any fees and you're getting taught something, yeah. right? That, that elicits a different amount of loyalty, right? But then at the same time, it's also like loyalty is a two-way street. Like you might be turning up and teaching as an example and you're not getting paid for it. If you're not getting paid for it as an example, then it's like, well... And then somebody else will be paying you to go and teach somewhere else. Well, loyalty is a two-way street, right? Yeah, like why would you stay in the same place if you're like not getting anything in return? Yeah. Like it needs to have an exchange yeah. of somehow. It doesn't really always need to be like money, but somehow you need to get. The, yeah, there has to be some kind of value. So it depends on where, where, where you put the value in. Is the value in the learning? Is the value in the training? Is the value in the money aspect? Um, and relationships are much the same, right? Like I think there has to be a value exchange and, th- and that value exchange is typically like uh, time and energy. Right, you're exchanging time and energy with each other, and you both want to get something out of that relationship, yeah. right? Um, yeah, like it's when I when I sort of think about your situation, it's I sort of can understand your perspective because you're thinking about okay, you got other pressures, right? Like you've, you're thinking about other things at the same time, which sort of then has put you in a bit of a mess, yeah, right? But then you know you've also reflected and realized, well, you know, there's no point. Um, being depressed and see, staying in that mess, it's it's actually better to just get out of that mess altogether and just start start again, right? And yeah, like um, unfortunately, yeah, there's certain things that are, are pretty hard, you know, when it comes to the legal system and things like that to get these things addressed. But like over time, it's like okay, once you get that addressed, it's like okay, how do I now prevent myself from getting stuck in this kind of a situation in the future, right? Um, yeah, relationships are uh, like I, I I always love talking about this idea because um. When I was uh, working in, in, in the car game, you know, uh, one of the things that's very big in, in the sales perspective is we have like this uh, sales process where we talk about, you know, what are the different steps to going and um, getting a person to purchase a car, right? And I, I would always translate that back into uh, relationships because what you're doing is you're just basically trying to uh, marry the right person with the right product yeah. versus the right person with the right person, right? And um, I think that, you know, Oftentimes in relationships, people don't focus on the right questions when they're dating and they get stuck into these relationships where because they haven't asked those right questions and, and got the answers to these, these things, um, to the things that you actually really need to know. And people avoid them because they're, they're difficult questions. It's not something that you can just like casually talk about it. Right? Right? Most people can't talk casually about something like that. And well, you get like... It's timing, right? Like yeah. if, I, if I just met you and, I, and like if I was a female and I said to you, hey, Gabe, you know, when do you want to have kids? You, you're, you're in your head you're probably thinking fuck that's a red flag yeah like if i don't want kids it's like yeah it's already like oh that's a no-no right and if i'm asking you this sort of stuff on the first date like that's pretty full-on right yeah so it, there's a bit of a, a, a timing element to it but at the same time it's like you got to look at okay well, what do you want to get out of this and so in any relationship right so if, um, not just thinking about romantic relationships if you're thinking about like um you know where you're training at the gym or which gyms you're training at like what are you trying to get out of training is, is probably an important question. What are you trying to get out of like learning these particular skills or what are you trying to get out of even your workplace, right? So, because if, if all you're trying to get out of your workplace is money, then you're always going to gravitate to the workplace that is going to offer you the most amount of money. But if the, the value equation is not just centric around money, it might be things like, okay, well, what is the lifestyle that you want to live? You know, what are the perks of working for this company and, and all of these other things? Well, that changes the value equation. Yeah, because right? now it's not just about the money. It's, it's not just about, about money. the, the yeah. life in experience in general. Like you need to get more than just that. Yeah. Which is 
pretty much with relationships as well. If you're Same just thing. trying to get one thing for a relationship, I just want to have kids. Yeah. Then are you willing to do anything to just have kids? Are you willing to like have a really bad partner, someone that you don't want to be with, or someone that you don't enjoy to be with? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you need to. That, that's one of definitely one of the things that I learned from this experience in general was. I felt like for three years I didn't have much to look forward in Australia, and now I feel like I have so much to look forward in it. Even that I only have like another three months to stay, I'm like, I can see myself coming back to Australia and being like, I'm coming back because of this. I would probably say four months, six months ago, I I didn't have anything. If someone asked, would you, if you have to leave, would you come back? I would probably say no, never. Yeah. And now I'm like, now that I'm out of this situation, out of like that perspective, I can see there is a lot here for yeah. me. Like it's not just like. It's not just the money, because honestly, I don't really care that much about the money. Right now, I, I'm trying to get a little bit more because I don't know exactly what I'm doing with my life in the next six months. I'm going to Thailand, I might stay there, I might go somewhere else. But if I would come back in Australia, I wouldn't do for the money. I wouldn't do for like to get a better life. I would come here because I love the place. I have people that I love. There is, there is stuff to do. Mm. There is things more than just money and security because it was one of the big reasons why I left Brazil. Mm too dangerous and you also can't make any money because the economy over there is pretty bad mm. so it's things like that but I, I do understand what you're trying to say with like seeing life from other perspective and trying to get more than just one thing or knowing at least what you want because yeah that's a, well it's the hardest thing is that how do you um, I guess the easiest way I can put this is that the more specific you are about what you want out of life then the easier it is to make actions that get you the specific outcome. Because you, you have right? a goal and then you have little yeah. steps to towards right. the goal. Yeah, because you think about it like, you know, even like say like the hobbies training jujitsu, right? Like I think too often uh, a, a hobbyist uh, mindset to jujitsu is like, I just want to not suck. <laughs> yeah, yeah right? like, I just don't want to tap to this guy anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Like, uh, But if you have this mindset that I just don't want to suck, then you're not actually like, you don't, you're not having any specific goals to actually improve, yeah. right? So if you actually have like, you know, okay, I'm getting stuck in bottom side control. Then it's like, okay, at least now you know, okay, let's, let's look at it technically and go, okay, you're stuck in bottom side control. What are your options? What escapes do you know? Yeah. How many escapes do you know, right? Or what, what's, what's your go-to, right? Like you, you need to be specific about the scenario before you can actually develop a, a solution to it, yeah. right? So so the same thing in life is like, you know, if you don't have a specific outcome that you're that you're looking for and you can't be specific about like, so, you know, people would say, well, I want money. Okay. How do how you want to earn that money? Or how right? much money? Yeah. And, you know, you just want to be rich. What is, what rich is rich to you? you right. Know, like um, and you just made me think of this conversation I had with um, one of uh, my wife's cousin's son. Yeah. One of my wife's cousin's sons. Cause he was like, um, he was finishing high school. And, and so we were over in uh, Malaysia visiting. And so then we're having this conversation and I, and he said to like, I, uh, um, he didn't really know what he wanted to do. And I said, okay, so what's important to you? And he goes, well, I want to make money, right? And I so I, I put this on him. I said, okay, so how do you want to make your money? Like, because do you want it? Like, I know guys that like clean offices, but have these multi-million dollar cleaning businesses. Is that how you want to make your money? He goes, oh, I don't want to clean. All right, so let's start to get specific because like you, you're saying that you, you wouldn't be w wanting to clean things or like say wash toilets as an example. Like people would say, why the fuck would you want to wash toilets? But if you had a multi-million dollar cleaning business... And you want to make money, why not? Why wouldn't you want to wash toilets? Yeah. Right? You, you, people say they don't want to be a, a garbage man, but if you you can make, you know, 80 to 120 grand a year being a garbage man, why the fuck wouldn't you want to be a garbage man? If that's what you cared about, right? Yeah. So, so th this is why it's like, you know, uh, I always challenge people to be really specific about like, what is it? What is their goal? The goal here and, and what is the outcome that you're actually trying to get? Because until you define that for yourself, how do you then work out what your steps are? to get back there, right? So, like, for you, you know, knowing that you want to come back, it's like, okay, well, first of all, I know that my current limitations are I've only got this period of time left on my current visa, and so I need to um, make plans for that and then look at, okay, what are my options in the future that, to then resolve that, right? Yeah. But I also feel like sometimes people get too anal about it. Like, they put a goal mm. and they like, I'm going to do that, and then they get too fussy or they get too cocky to be like, actually, my goal changed. Like I feel like people have a fear of the change and sometimes they feel like they fail if they change their goal or if they have a different mindset from now on. And you see that all the time with people. And right now what I'm trying to do with myself is because I had like a huge goal here in Australia. My goal was 
to base myself in Australia. That was my uh, my primary goal when I came to Australia. It wasn't like leaving Australia and make a lot of money. My goal in Australia was to base myself as a permanent resident, mm. and then after that, I would have more options with other stuff. I always I also have the goal to have my own gym, but I put this goal as a little bit of a hold because I know I want to get better at Jiu Jitsu first. Mm. And then at the time, I, like I tried to set my like my little goals for Jiu Jitsu every time I'm training, and I set my goals for like every two months when I'm training. So every two months, I'm kind of like currently working on something. And I get it. Sometimes it's hard. Like life happens. You get like a bad week or like work. You can't really choose that many options, especially when you're in a situation like in an immigrant situation. It's really hard to get any kind of jobs because there is working limitations. There is like skill sets. English is not like exactly the same thing. Like I'm. Um, to get a job for me in Brazil so, and in, like in a good job, like something in a higher position is so much easier than in Australia. Not just because of the language barrier, but like because of the connections I have over there or everything. So uh, what I'm thinking for myself and when I'm setting my goals, especially uh, at the end of last year with the whole thing happening, I was still in the middle of the storm. I was still living in the same house with my ex-partner. I was trying to just see clear at least a few things that I want to, I know I have to leave Australia. There's nothing I can do about it. I had a look, I spoke to lawyers. They told me, honestly, right now you're in a really bad situation. You can't do anything about it. I accept it. I'm still angry about it. I'm still upset. But it, like, it's not something that making me stop and just make me depressed. And I told myself, you know what you haven't done in 10 years? Because I've been working for 10 years, which is crazy because I'm only 25. And I was like, I actually wor been working for 11 years now. And I was like, you never had a holiday. And I was like, maybe that's going to be my next goal. Have a holiday and know how to enjoy it. And then actually Riz was here in the gym today. And I was like, gosh, it's good to see him here. Because I was like, during New Year's Eve, I was like, I, he posted something about like traveling to do jiu-jitsu around the world. And I was like, why am I going to Brazil? I don't want to be there because I bought flights to Brazil. And I decided, you know what? I'm canceling these flights. I canceled the flights. I got fully refounded. I'm going to Thailand. I'm going to have at least three weeks of holidays. Yep. And during those holidays, I'm not thinking about how I'm going to make money. I'm not thinking about finding a job. I'm thinking about going to Thailand, training a lot of jiu-jitsu. <laughs> and in May, when the boys are going to do the trials, I'm going to be in Bangkok. There. And I'm going to hang out with them. So I'm going to have a whole month after 11 years. Because I never had like over like a week of like holidays yep. in 11 years. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to have a whole month of holidays. I still not gonna try to spend like a lot of money because I'm not no. like that. I I wanna train. That's what I wanna do. That's my holidays. Mm. It's like getting better jiu jitsu is my holidays. Yeah. So that's what I'm gonna do. And then once I finally get out of this whole situation when my mind's clear, when I'm in Asia eating a lot of noodles, <laughs> and I like, see the boys <laughs> smash and get like at least two go to medals from for the gym, then I'm gonna be like, you know what? Now I'm gonna decide exactly what I'm doing for the next two years. I have a goal that is like train jiu jitsu full time for the next two years. And work around that. I do want to have a f I have a few comps that I have in mind that I already put as my goals to 2025, 2024. Mm. But the specific location where I'm going to be doing, how I'm going to be doing, I don't have everything written down because I felt like it's it's too many variants right now for mm. me to set up a proper goal. Yep. But I do have things looking forward. And I feel like sometimes that's what people need. Not like an end goal and like step by step, but at least have something to, you know, like, not just like I'm just doing stuff and figure out because that's how life goes by really quick. Mm. You don't realize like that last week was actually not last week. Last week was a month and a half ago. Yeah. And you've been talking about doing weights. You've been talking about making more money. You've been talking about quitting your shit job because you don't like it. Mm. But you don't have a goal for when or like how. But sometimes they do like too many steps. And I feel like that's can be, that can be really overwhelming as well. If you have way too many steps, sometimes you just, you fail one and you feel like, oh gosh, I, I completely fucked up my entire goal because mm. I failed this step of 100 out of 605. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it happens every day, you know, like, uh, you know, like I think anybody that has kids or a bad sleep or you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and then it's like, or you wake up late and they can fuck up your whole day, right? Yeah. If you let it. Yeah. Right? Like that's the thing. Like there are people that will just um, get caught up in these negative spirals just because it's like, okay, my day didn't start right. So the whole day's all right off. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. And sometimes it becomes my whole week off. Like yeah. Because I had one bad day or I had like one bad night of sleep and you just keep blaming that for it. Yeah. And you, 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 I've seen that a lot actually lately, especially with my ex-partner. was like that kind of victimizing um, type of person that like 
something happened to me once and now I'm like this and because of this I can't never be the same or it can't be better mm. and keep lying to yourself like oh I'm actually doing everything I can and then when you look deeply into it you're not really doing anything you're just lying to yourself and being like yeah but like I, I did lift weights yeah once every three weeks <laughs> you're not like lifting weights you're not getting closer to your goal or you're not eating properly or you're just like doing the bare minimum and being like why they don't get results I see that in the gym quite often as well people ask like oh why why my jiu-jitsu is not like becoming better or why I'm still getting stuck in this because you're not really doing anything towards you're yeah. just telling yourself you're doing yeah. which is very different from Actually doing the work. Yeah. Yeah. I got I got uh, I want to circle back to this and this will be like the, the last one before we wrap it up. But, oh, yeah. uh, and I'm curious about this because I reckon I was probably similar to you, uh, the savior complex, you know? Uh, so getting into relationships that you feel like you can fix this other person. Um, and I, 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 not to say that, you know, I was dating people that I thought I could fix. Um, but I, I, I always, um, so what's the right way to put it? I would say that in some relationships that I've had, um, yeah, like it wasn't like, it, it was like, you know, I, I thought, felt like I could, you know, um, make things better for other oh, yeah. people. Right. But that's not really the, uh, yes, it is a part of the goal of a relationship, but I think you're never going to be able to fix somebody who doesn't want to fix themselves. And you're never going to be able to help somebody who doesn't help themselves. Right. So I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that definitely uh, changed for me when I had like uh, some time off relationships and, and got to like work on myself and spend some time, you know, uh, thinking about, you know, who I was and what, what was it that I wanted, you know, chances are the look, reality is probably there was nothing really wrong with those people that I dated. The problem was actually myself. Yeah. But uh, I'm just curious about, you know, your perspective on, oh. on why, you, why, you, why you have like, you feel like you have this bit of a savior complex. In yeah, I, I, I definitely know where it comes from because I did work quite a bit on that with like my therapist and like a little bit over the years reading stuff and like uh, listening to stuff but I feel like for me is more like what the whole situation what happened with my mom and my dad mm. and I definitely like I feel like when he started like this kind of like savior complex was because of my mom so lots of mommy issues over there yeah because like when my mom my mom and dad broke up was because my dad was actually cheating on my mom for like months okay and then sometimes this go bo- can go both ways you become a, a cheater and like you can't really see a relationship without cheating the person which you see all the time especially with men or it can go the other way and you feel like you're too loyal to someone and that can be like it, it that's probably why i got so upset about the whole thing with my ex-partner was the betrayal from my friend to me it wasn't even with my ex-partner it was more my friend than with me and seeing my mom the way i saw her crying and ripping like shirts off my dad out like she was literally like that was when I got home and she was like ripping like his shirts off and she didn't even like my dad so if you can get that upset about someone that you don't even like and now I understand why my mom was so upset it wasn't because she liked my dad it was because she gave up like a good part of her life to have me and my brother and stay with my dad like seven years is a long time to be with someone that he don't like it. And my mom told me that multiple, multiple times after I got older that she never really loved my dad. She never said once to my dad that she, she loved him. And then I understood, it was like, oh, okay. So my mom never really liked my dad. And I felt like a good part of my uh, childhood was me, not that my mom needed it or she asked me for it, or but I felt like I was trying to help my mom to get better to feel good and blah, blah, blah. And my mom was so stressed about everything in life. She was so anxious. She's still like a super anxious person. And it's nowadays after like so many years, like almost 20 years that I realized that my mom and I were very similar. We have very anxious like personalities. We're very anxious people in general about work, life in general. And I feel like the savior complex came came from that, from seeing my mom so broken that I felt like, oh, I need to help this person. And then when I see someone like that, it kind of, gets back to your childhood and pretty much what and it was right in that development phase of like six to eight years old where you're trying to kind of decide who you're going to be not really deciding but like what like psychology happened to you like yeah um, you you fucking hit a nerve for me gabe <laughs> sorry <laughs> but, no because um <laughs> hearing you talk about that 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 was um yeah my mum was doing the same thing when i was in like year 11 or year 12 you know bawling her eyes out because my dad did the wrong thing and it's it's hard it's hard to see something like that it can go like i say can go both ways or you relate more to your dad which i don't think i do 
most aspects of life. Or you can go to your side of your mom and see that and be like, I need to be the person that saved that person. I mean, it's your mom. You don't want to see her. Yeah. Upset. You you see her upset. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, it, bro- it broke my mom mentally. Um, you know, I've talked about, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, but that was, that was probably the catalyst for a lot of my mom's mental health issues. Oh. And, and then, you know, that ended up, you know, like, and I, I don't, and I don't say this in any way that like, you know, of course you don't wish it on, on anyone, right? That's the hand that I was dealt and I played that hand to, you know, the best that I could. And so I just invested in, you know, myself and working and working and working and working. Um, and I, I won't go through it because it's obviously been something I've covered before, but like, I guess, um, I, I'm, I'm curious and this is just because of my own curiosity about like what happened between me and my dad as a result of it. Like I obviously held a lot of resentment towards Oof, my dad. So much. Yeah. So much. So it's the same for you? Yeah, I still have a lot of resentment to my dad. I told him a few times that, but he's like, the relationship I have with my mom. <laughs> wait, wait, so when you choked him out or when you mounted him and submitted yeah. him, there was more to that. There was yeah. some there was some negativity there. Oh, a lot, a lot. <laughs> and in therapy is the same. Like every time I talk about my dad in therapy, my therapist goes like, and like for multiple therapies, therapists that I did, they were like, every time you talk about your dad, you go like, fuck, here yeah. we go again. Yeah. And then the thing with my dad was like, I feel like he was always very, and still nowadays, I still feel like sometimes he's very delusional about what he wants in life. He's a very lost person of like, what I want to do with my life, what mm. I want. is a lot, a lot of like, fake goals over there. Like, mm. oh, I have a goal, but it's not really a goal. It's just like something to keep my mind out of like, stress, which I don't really understand because I can't have like a, that much of a deep conversation with my dad it just doesn't happen i tried before and just we just don't go there which with my mom is completely different my mom and i since i don't know since i remember we always spoke about everything life sex uh drugs everything there's no one thing that we don't talk about there is a few things that happened with my ex that i didn't talk to my mom because i felt like it was a little bit too much for her mm-hmm. i felt like all right she understand what happened and uh, have an idea. That's what she needs to know right now. I don't feel comfortable to tell her what yeah, exactly was happening. Yeah. Because it's, it's a lot of like bad stuff. But I was like, when I talk about my dad, then it's the, the opposite. It's like, I feel like because of what he did to my mom, there's a lot of resentment there. And I also see my dad dating multiple people during his life. And my mom literally like not dating anyone. She had like two boyfriends since... Like, they broke up. And my dad already had, like, probably five or seven that he lived with. Mm. And I'm going, like, there is definitely a problem in one of them. And I don't believe it's with my mom. Because, <laughs> like, <laughs> if you can't, if you can't, if you can't, if you have that many commi- commitment issues, there's something that you need to work on. Mm. I'm not saying, like, oh, maybe, I don't know, maybe all my dad's partner were actually not good and he just move on. Or he doesn't know how to commit to something. Yeah. And then once he loses, he feels guilty and depressed about it because that's pretty much what happened with my mom and him. You know, until nowadays, he's like, oh, yeah, and your mom's like the love of my life. And my mom's like, I never even said I love you. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, it's that feeling of like you lost something that you had and now you realize you lost something. Yeah. And I feel like with my dad, everything is kind of like that. Like he lose something and he realized, oh, gosh, I wish I had it. And there's a lot to do also with like when my, grandpa- my granddad, my dad's dad passed away, I felt like it was the same. And I couldn't even talk about my granddad dying, like, because he had cancer, so it was a process of lying, it wasn't just dying. Mm. And I feel like with my dad, was like, we can't talk about this because you don't know how to talk about deep conversations. He, he doesn't know how to connect to that emotion. No, not at so all. He, what, he never grieved? You didn't see him cry about it? or I've seen, that's the thing, I've seen my dad crying before many times, but it wasn't like for, uh, like, anger issues, not from being Sadness. sad. And it, uh, crying for being angry, angry and crying from being sad is completely different it's not the same uh, feeling and you just don't know how to express yourself and when my dad my granddad died i was already in australia actually when i came to australia he was already with cancer and i was like so worried that he was going to die when i got here that i told him like don't tell me if he dies because it's gonna crash me yeah and then it took longer actually it took a year and a half after i got here for him to actually pass away and then i would talk to my dad why it was happening and he just couldn't tell me like he would just be like, no, yeah, uh, grand, like your granddad is fine, and I would look at photos and it look like skin and bones. Mm. Like that guy is not is not right. Yeah. He's like more on the other side than he. Like, come on, talk yeah. to me. And I I call him multiple times. And it was like, just talk to me. Was like, what's going on? Well, how are you feeling? And he's like, no, no, I'm fine. Like, how can you be fine when you, your dad is like this close of like? And it's not like he that 
he didn't see my granddad every day. They worked together. So he would see my granddad every day for the past like 40 years of his life. Mm. It's not like one of those persons like me that I left home and now I haven't seen my dad in five years. Mm. You know, it's like, it's, you see the person every day. Even if it wasn't your grand, your dad, it's someone that you've been seeing for 40 years. It's like There's connection there. There's more than like, I'm fine with him dying Yeah, to, to that. And that's pretty much what like the resentment with my dad comes from. It's like the whole not knowing how to communicate and affect me in many ways because mm. until I learn how to communicate because I'm, I'm I'm good at talking about what's going on and uh, like things in my life but also at the same time putting myself out of it so like I can talk about like my problems and be like I'm talking kind of like talking about someone else's problem and not really me mm. and just disassociate from it yeah because it feels easy to talk about like your problems when you're not talking about yourself yeah you know what I mean like yeah well, I, I think, you know, the the benefit, the only, or well, the positive, I guess, of that is that you learn what not to do, you know? Oh, yeah. A, a, how, how, to, how to conduct yourself as a person, right? Kinda, like, it kind of gives that, that vibe of, like, that we were talking about before. You have a goal, but you, you just know what you don't want to do. Yeah. At least you have, like, a, <laughs> an idea of things that y- you consider, at least in your uh, perspective of life, what is wrong and what is right. Yeah. Because, like, you know, if you think about it, right, like, that, that you know, the mistakes that your dad made, that could be you. Making yep. the same mistakes, right? Yep. And and so how fortunate you are to be in a position where you can actually view that objectively and go, well, I don't want to be like that. Right? Same thing, like, you know, the mistakes my dad made, I, I could make those same mistakes, but I choose not to make those mistakes, yep. right? So that's the difference. And I think, you know, everybody has that conscious uh, capacity to make better choices, but you just have to decide that, you know, do you want to, yeah, are you... Every day, are you, you going to be a little bit more to good or a little bit more to evil? Which, <laughs> yeah. like, you have to choose. At some at some point, you're going to have to at least choose. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Even that is sometimes you don't realize you're choosing. You, you, you choose. Yeah, even not doing something is a choice. Yeah. Right. Like I, I think you know that's one of the biggest. Um, uh, what is it? What's the right word? Misconceptions out there is when people like they go, "Oh, I'm thinking about it." Right, but if you actually just changed your mindset and said, anytime that you had to say, "I'm thinking about something," just say it's a no. Then you can actually really work out whether you want to do something or you don't. So rather than saying, "I'm thinking about it," well, okay, if I'm thinking about, it, I'll just say no. And it's like, oh fuck, I don't want to say no. Well, then it, just fucking do it. Just make it a yes. You, you have two choices. Right? You don't need to do like a third choice of like maybe. Yeah, I feel I, I remember. Li- li- Hearing that once and I was like, that's so dumb. But then sometimes I go like, actually, it's not that dumb. <laughs> that people say like, there's there's no such a thing as a maybe. Yeah. Because actually, like, there's no um, maybe I ate yesterday. No, or you did or you did not. Yeah. Like, Every, it's a choice. You either choose to do something or you choose not to do something. Yeah, like, yeah. eventually you're going to have to choose. It yep. doesn't matter what you're doing. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? All right. Well, um, yeah, we uh, we covered plenty <laughs> of this. So, if people want to find you, uh, you're doing privates as well at the moment. Oh yeah, I'm doing, doing a few privates just to save a bit of extra money, like 45 minute sessions. Pretty cheap, honestly. It's like 50 bucks for 45 minutes. Okay. And if you want to like follow my Instagram, get me more followers, please help. Is Gabriel, which is G A B R E U. Yep. B J J. Okay. Yep. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you in the next one. <laughs>